What's he supposed to be doing? Well, it's a statue of Atlas, Tommy. He's carrying the world on his shoulders. No kidding. That's what Grandma says you're doing. And she wishes you'd leave the world alone a while. Oh, yeah? Looks like I'm gonna have to slug Grandma. Welcome to The Rank with John and Zach. I'm John. I'm Zach. We've been friends since Cub Scouts, and now 30 years later, we decided to start a podcast where we'll be ranking anything and everything. You know, the natural progression of events for millennials. You're probably wondering what credentials we have to rank anything. Well, we don't have any. And if you disagree, join the discussion at The Rank Podcast on Twitter or X, threads, Instagram, and TikTok on our website, at the rank with John and Zach.com or at our email address, uh, the rank with John and Zach at protonmail.com. You can also support us on Patreon at the rank podcast. That's patreon.com slash the rank podcast. And you can check out clips or full episodes on our YouTube channel, the rank with John and Zach. And please remember to rate review and subscribe so we can keep this thing going. Hey, we're, we want to uh, to hear from you guys. I want to start off even before our banter here to say, reach out to us on social media, whatever, and just let us know what year you want us to rank next. Now, obviously, the next one's going to be 2023 because that's what's happening next. But after 2023 is done, what year do you want us to do? Let us know. Reach out. Comment on stuff and send us emails or whatever. Let us know. So you're saying how your dogs, yeah. before we got started here, they... They uh, they have trouble going to the bathroom when you take them out. Yeah, is it like every time or just because it's raining today? It's it's because of the rain. They uh, are like I don't understand how they're like animals and they have they have fur and everything. They're not like a naked cat, you know, one of those cats. But uh, like they cannot stay in the rain, even if it's just uh, it's just like the Missy Elliott song. So even if it's just like a little drizzle. It's uh like they get all upset and they they like cower when we go outside and they immediately try to go back in and it's like guys, it's for it's not because like people are gonna be like well if it's a thunderstorm they're afraid no I mean like it's a fucking drizzle yeah and my dogs do the same thing it's like what is with you guys there are dogs who jump purposefully into lakes <laughs> they like being wet <laughs> but a little bit of water from the sky upsets them to know to no and then like they want to come back in and then they'll want to go right back out because like they right because they need to right go to the bathroom and they're like and they're oh yeah like, i have to go yeah and it's like okay so you need to go while we're out there so it yeah by the way so i'm like i'm mad at my dogs i love them they're just a little annoying aren't you well that's a good segue into uh <laughs> gentlemen's, gentlemen's agreement, agreement. I think. <laughs> why don't you give us an agenda for that one yeah, we're going to have an agenda today where we uh, talk about uh, some banter, which was that, after which we're going to, um, what do we do next? Uh, we have a movie summary where you summarize the movie, hopefully you do it, because I didn't have something prepared, and uh, after which we, okay, good, after which we do potent notables where we learn interesting facts about the movie. And um, uh, then we do the movie overview where we talk about the movie all the way through E. And uh, it didn't rhyme. And <laughs> I was I like, know. "Why'd you say through it? I thought it, in my head it rhymed. And then I said it out loud. Oh, movie <laughs> and through it. Gotcha. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. Then we do the rank where we rank the movie on a hundred thousand categories, going from one to a zillion. Yeah, a zillion being the best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's talk about the movie we're uh, we're here for today. Gentlemen's Agreement, the 1947 film starring Gregory Peck, Dorothy McGuire, and John Garfield, with a screenplay by Moss Hart. It was adapted from the novel of the same name by Laura Z. Hobson, and it was directed by Elia Kazan. It was nominated for eight Oscars, winning three. The nominations it didn't win were for Best Film Editing, Best Writing, Moss Hart, mm -hmm. Best Supporting Actress for Anne Revere, who played... Gregory Peck's mom, mm -hmm. best actress for Dorothy McGuire, and best actor for Gregory Peck. So those didn't win. Those ones. those are the ones that didn't win. Um, the ones that won were best supporting actors for Celeste Holm, mm -hmm. who played uh, the like marketing, the, fi the financial manager lady. Anne wasn't she? She was like into him, but like yeah. Um, I don't. I don't remember her being the financial. I remember her being the fashion editor. Fashion, not financial. Yeah, fashion. Sorry. 
I only mentioned with F. It's a bit of a difference. Yeah, it's a huge difference. Um, not really, though. It's the same thing. But think about this. She won Best Supporting Actress, and we mm -hmm. had in this movie there was another Best Supporting Actress nomination. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true. I didn't even think of that. So yeah, so both supporting actresses and the lead actress were nominated, mm. and only the one won. And she's like, "What do you think about that?" Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And then it also won for Best Director for Elia Kazan and Best Picture. So this is the Best Picture winner. Mm. So the story revolves around a journalist named Phil Green, played by Gregory Peck, who pretends to be Jewish to explore anti-Semitism in post-World War II America. Assigned to write an article on the subject, Green experiences ex discrimination firsthand and witnesses the prejudice prejudices of those around him. The film delves into issues of bigotry, social norms, and the challenges faced by those control confronting discrimination. As Green immerses himself in his investigative role, the movie highlights the moral and ethical dilemmas surrounding intolerance and the importance of speaking out against injustice. So that's my summary. It's a good summary. I think mine would have been. I think we should have heard yours. No, it's fine. <laughs> well, on to our fourth and fifth, not fourth of five nominees from 1947. So we're almost done with 1947. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, so far, <laughs> so far, the bishop's wife is actually the standout. Well done, bishop's wife. But this is the one that actually won. So we'll have to see. Yeah. Of course, Brooklyn is still our number one best picture nominee of all time. And I'm curious how long it'll stay there. You know, like. Will it be ever usurped? I think I think at some point it will. I feel like it's I feel like it's not the best movie of all time. Right. So I, at some point it's really know, good though. Yeah, we liked it. <laughs> it's just, you know, I do kind of wonder if some of these will get on top there. Yeah. I feel like they might. I'm also curious if we're gonna have a third straight year where the movie that actually won Best Picture will not end up being the movie that won the ranks best picture. Yeah, that Academy is pretty stupid so far. So we'll see if they've <laughs> pretty wise... dumb. It's, we'll see if they've wisened up in the past. <laughs> they were wiser in the past. It's, we'll see if they were wiser in the past. There's <laughs> the right. There's the right tense. That's the harder thing about time traveling. It's not you know the whole paradoxes and your universe being you know destroyed. Um, it's what tense do you use? I w I will have you know I will have have done in the future you know difficult it is difficult you're right only one way to find out so let's get into it starting with the potent notables mm. potent notables. as always we start our potent notables with the box office results working from the same variety article that i found for the bishop's wife um, I've got the quote unquote rentals for gentlemen's agreement. It made $3.9 million, which made it the eighth highest grossing film of that year. Mm, the eighth highest grossing film of that year, which is kind of funny to think about, you know, yeah. it's, that would be a serious flop. Mm -hmm. It had a budget of $1.985 million. So it must've made at least $6 million at the box office, right? Cause the rentals are actually the uh, profit. Yeah. Also, that feels like a really high budget for the time, doesn't it? It, it counts. A million does. dollar budget? Yeah. What, was it salaries? Or I, I, like it I couldn't salaries. find a breakdown, but I mean, there were a lot of actors in this, so you're, yeah. you're probably on to something. Uh, I, and I saw, I saw that John Garfield was, uh, you know, he played Mr. Heineke or whatever the hell his name is. Minifee? Minifee. Minifee. I don't know how I got there from that. Um, yeah, well, you got there. That's all that matters. <laughs> so, Mister Minifee, he he's he played him. Also, the only Jew in the cast. Oh, really? The only yeah. actual. Yeah. And um, and it, I saw that the producers they, even though he doesn't play like a starring role, he doesn't have a lead role. They still gave him lead pay. Oh yeah. To be in the movie. Congratulations, you. I don't Whatever know. his name was. I can't remember. Don Garfield. Uh, yeah, that's him. Not to be confused with James A. Garfield. Which everyone was in danger of doing. So. Right. He's he's our 20th president, people, who was assassinated. But 
he probably would have survived if not for bad doctoring. Yeah. I thought you meant like they doctored the results. <laughs> like the <laughs> like the election was rigged. I'm like, they're going no. on like that back then, even. But he died no, of I... sepsis because the doctor was like, here, let me get this bullet out and just stuck his bare hand into the wound <laughs> repeatedly. <laughs> He'd been eating flaming hot Cheetos beforehand as well. <laughs> exactly. So he was like all orange. He's like, suck. Let me get right in there. <laughs> it had uh what, what did we just watch recently with the squishy sound effects? It was really out of control. Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers with the squishy sound effects. That's yep. it was exactly Cat Casper Van Dien. Um putting his, you know, dissecting that bug and just like reaching in. Yeah, yeah, squish, 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 squish. That's like a literal. They also exactly. weren't wearing gloves, so yeah, you're right. They just went right in because that's how I guess it works. I don't know. Well, Gregory Peck said, "Quote: My agent told me not to take the role, and then because this is and this is Gregory Peck quoting his agent. Mm -hmm. Quote: They'll think you're a Jew. Yeah. He's like, have you read the script? You know, like <laughs> <laughs> seriously, I feel like you should read it. Well, not only that, but it's like." You know, I think his point was they're going to think you're a Jew for making a film where you're like protecting Jews, essentially. Heaven forbid. Yeah. Can you imagine? I don't know about all that. <laughs> so Gregory Peck did not get along with director Elliot Kazan. Oh, really? Kazan actually told the press he was very disappointed with Peck's performance and the oh. two men never worked together again. That's kind of lame. Yeah. Going to shit on someone in the press. However, in 1984, Gregory Peck claimed to have been misquoted in a 1967 interview in which he said Elliot Kazan was the wrong director for the film. Oh, okay. He said, so this is some yeah, sniping back and forth. Exactly. In like decades apart. <clears throat> he said, quote, that's a misunderstanding. I don't think there could have been a better director for the film. What I meant was that he and I didn't have a rapport emotionally. We were not on the same wavelength. I don't think that I did my best work for him. I, if I worked with him now as a mature man, I think I would give him everything he would want. That's a mature, learned man. Yeah. I'd give, I'd give him everything he wants. I know. I thought it was a weird way to put that. but Alrighty. <laughs> Whatever, Greg. <laughs> now, despite winning an Oscar for his direction, Elliot Kazan revealed in a later interview that he was never fond of this movie, feeling that it lacked passion on his part, and he thought that the romance was too forced. The romance well okay we'll get into it <laughs> um gregory peck also later said regarding this film quote we felt we were brave pioneers exploring anti-semitism in the united states today it seems a little dated and really hmm. well this is probably you know the 80s that he said yes yeah, that's true you know i bet if you were alive today you'd be like holy shit what happened yeah <laughs> And they'd be like, oh, Trump happened. That's what happened, yeah. Oops. I like. I saw this one that was Make Racists Afraid Again. I like that one. Yeah, it's a good one. The role of Philip Green was actually first offered to Cary Grant. Oh. He it, yeah, he was turned he, it down. Was he busy making a fish, Bishop's Wife? No, he refused oh. the role because he contended he was Jewish and thought he looked Jewish. He maintained, quote, the public won't believe my portrayal of a Gentile trying to pass himself off as a Jew. I'd never heard he was Jewish. Oh, so. me either. <laughs> I guess. Okay. <laughs> if you say so, Carrie. <laughs> it's interesting, though. So when other studio chiefs who were mostly Jewish heard about the making of this film, they asked the producer not to make it. Oh, no. They feared its theme of anti-Semitism would simply stir up a hornet's nest about a problem which they preferred to handle quietly. Not only did production continue, but a scene was subsequently included that mirrored that confrontation. Isn't that mm. funny? That is I funny. I think you know what I'm talking about there, too. Yeah. I, re I, I remember when the scene came up when I was watching, I was like, hey, that's the one! <laughs> <laughs> a little, maybe a little more excited than, than need to be, but that's okay. <laughs> I don't think I was quite like that. But, you know. Hey, it's the scene! I, it says, he says to nobody in the yeah. basement. <laughs> Wait, that sounds kind of creepy, actually. I don't know. That's, that's where I do all my work. Just oh. sitting in the dungeon. Ooh. Well, before the book was published, 20th Century Fox's top producer, Daryl Zanuck, read the galley, the, the galley proofs. 
-hmm. He liked the idea of making it into a movie. So when the book gained wide acceptance, Zanuck was convinced. Quote, serious movies up to now have almost invariably been box office failures. Movie producers were understandably afraid of them. When I read Gentleman's Agreement, I knew I had to take another to take another chance. Mm -hmm. This was a way to reply to all the attacks on Hollywood, that we put too much emphasis on the frivolous side of life. This was a way to show that we can tell a serious story without being dull. I was astonished, however, when I when told I was courageous for making this movie. It just looked to me like it would be a terrific show. End quote. Hmm. Didn't even know I was making a civil rights kind of thing. <laughs> I think he's being a little modest there. So when Politico businessman Eric Johnston signed on as the industry's number one front man for, the, for <laughs> producing this movie... Sorry, the industry's number one front man. <laughs> That's Seven how they roll. years in a row, this guy. <laughs> it's on his business cards and everything. <laughs> number one front man, huh? Get this, get this <laughs> changed. Every... Man, <laughs> we got to get him as our front man, I guess. What, do we have a band? <laughs> well, he expounded on the idea that movies can teach as well as entertain. Movies, he said, are the greatest medium of mass enlightenment ever conceived. And to those critics who cried... But we're in business to entertain, not enlighten. Johnson Johnston answered, "All right, let's do both." Hmm. I actually kind of like that. Yeah, that is nice. No wonder he's the number one front man. Exactly. That he earned that. Yeah, ex stuff like that, that that proves. All right. So the movie mentions three real people, well known for their racism and anti-Semitism at the time: Senator Theodore Bilbo, Democrat of Mississippi. Yeah, they kept saying his name, and I kept not knowing who it was. Yeah, well, it's a you know, it's like a pop culture reference of the '40s, like when when Miracle on 34th Street, when they were talking about the the diner, or whatever the restaurant. Remember the guy oh, yeah, thought yeah. it was the prince, yeah, of Russia. Anyway, and no, but uh, I was hearing it in 2020, whatever year we're in here. I kept going, Bilbo Baggins. What is I know talking <laughs> about? Who is this guy? Like I kind of put it together that it was oh, that's an anti-Semite guy. I don't know, but you know. <laughs> Well, he advocated for sending all African Americans back to Africa. Oh, okay. <laughs> Representative John Rankin, a Democrat of Mississippi, who called columnist Walter Winchell, quote, the little kike, end quote, on the oh, yeah. floor of the House of Representatives. How nice. Yeah. And leader of Share Our Wealth and Christian Nationalist Crusade, Gerald L.K. Smith who tried legal means to prevent 20th Century Fox from showing the movie in Tulsa. He lost the case, but then sued Fox for a million dollars. The case Why? was thrown out of court in 1951. Uh, just, he's got to protect the Tulsa you know, public from this. I think we've learned that Tulsa is not a nice place. No, fuck Tulsa. For anybody who's not white. Mm -hmm. In September 1948, the film was rejected for showing in Spain. What happened? What did Spain? What's their issue? The ban was instigate, instigated, quote, by order of the ecclesiastical member of the film censorship board on moral grounds. According to a source close to the board, the uh, the banning order stipulated that it, while it was a Christian duty to stimulate love among individuals, societies, nations, and peoples, this should not extend to Jews. Oh. Wow. I, I'm not racist. I think racism is wrong, except Jews. Fuck that. <laughs> yeah. The report listed six points or, quote, theological errors, end quote, of the film that warranted the ban, including that the film declared that a Christian is not superior to a Jew. Oh, my God. They're just yeah. coming right. I like this, actually. They're just coming right out and saying it. You know, yeah. they're, not, they're not like being coy. They're just like, no, not true. Yeah, I am better than Jews. And that the film asserts that, quote, for many Jews, it is a matter of pride to be called Jew. Pride of what? The pride of being the people who put God to death, of being perfidious, as they are called in, ho in Holy Scripture, end quote. Wow, they sound nice. I almost yeah. like, I, I yearn for Tulsa. <laughs> so on October 3rd, 1948, according to The Hollywood Reporter, the president of the Board of Film Censors in Madrid, Gabriel Garcia Espina, called the statement reported in the Times to be a calumny and that the film was in fact banned because anti-Semitism was not an issue in Spain. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> oh man. Well, you know, it's it's funny how little things change because uh, who are the people who are convinced that racism isn't an issue here? Is it people who are racists or aren't racists? <laughs> it's right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but no, this actually, I mean, I don't even know if I should bring it up, but it reminds me of sometimes on the internet, you'll see people like from Europe. Sorry, Europe. Um, they'll like, you know, America's so racist. And then they turn around and go, well, um, but, 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 you know, they, they say gypsies, they don't say Romani, but gypsies are a real problem here. They're, they're actually awful. And it's like, wait a second, hold on. So it's like, what? So you're not racist in Europe, but fuck gypsies apparently in your parlance. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it's just, you probably, you know, a lot of people probably have some sort of blind spot like that where they think that they're, because I don't think anybody thinks they're a bad person. They just think they have reasons for thinking the way they do. Right, exactly. I'm sure that there's something out there for me and probably you too without even realizing it, you know? Well, the only person I'm racist against is racists. Wait, hold on. That doesn't really work. I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, That's, whatever. Maybe it's the Dutch. I like to think of myself as a pretty widely accepting person. So, um, But, you know... I don't know. Maybe I have a blind spot. I would hope that somebody would point it out to me, to be honest. If I did, you know. No, you're set. I've checked. <laughs> well, Espina, same guy here, he said, quote, there is no racial problem in Spain. We do not know here the conflict of Semitism or anti-Semitism. What? Okay. All right. It's Minister of Propaganda here. Is that who this guy is? Cause... And precisely because of the beautiful and traditional Spanish idea of human freedom, these anguishing racial differences that have disturbed so much, and they do disturb the lives of the peoples, are alien to us. And we want them to continue being alien to us. End quote. Hmm. I... <laughs> I, um, uh, yeah. It's, what, what do you I, say to that? I have no idea. So just... Yeah, this we don't have this thing, so why would we ever show it? I mean, it's just a weird. His argument is flawed. <laughs> you think? <laughs> um, Hold on. Who's a uh, who's who is a uh, what government in Spain was this at the time? By the way, the post World War II government. You know, mm. I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, uh, Frank, Franco was prime minister until seventy three. Oh, so it was still Franco. It was still Franco, yeah. yeah. So uh, that makes and, sense to me then. <laughs> yeah, it's a great government. No, yeah, there is nothing wrong with that. Everybody knows fascists or anti racists. Well, always... the timeliness of the film is revealed by a telling exchange that took place between screenwriter Moss Hart and a stagehand, as reported in the Saturday Review, December 6th, 1947. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quote, you know. A stagehand is reported to have said to Mr. Hart, I've loved working on this picture of yours. Usually I play gin rummy with the boys when scenes are being shot, but not this time. This time I couldn't leave the set. The picture has such a wonderful moral, I didn't want to miss it. Really? Beamed Mr. Hart, pleased not only as a, as a scenarist, but as a reformer. Mm -hmm. That's fine. What's the moral as you see it? Well, I tell you, replied the stagehand, henceforth I'm always going to be good to Jewish people because you never can tell when they will turn out to be Gentiles. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. I bet I bet. Um, uh, yeah, he just walked into the ocean after that. You know, like, all right. right. <laughs> this is useless. I give up. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I also love the idea that making movies is so well. I actually, I guess making movies is boring. So yeah, just I've heard that it's me. pretty boring. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of sitting. I, I don't know what. And uh, hey, I was just about to say, I don't know what they did before the day of the cell phones, and I guess played gin for me. Yeah, <laughs> get a game going. Well, these next few potent notables are going to come from an interview with Celeste Holm years after the movie was released. Mm -hmm. Okay, she didn't expect to win an Academy Award for her performance, and. Um, after all that year, Ethel Barrymore was also nominated for Best Supporting Actress, and in Holmes' mind, her peer was certain to win. Mm -hmm. In fact, she was so certain that she only casually thought about what she would say if she won. So, quote, so when Donald Crisp called out my name, mispronouncing it, all of a sudden I thought, I lost my mind, because every light in the theater hits you. You're blinded and numbed. Um, so 
she said her her legs were felt like they were made of caramel <laughs> mm-hmm. okay. and she was helped to her feet and she found her way to the stage quote i suddenly realized i hadn't prepared but something came to mind and then i burst into tears and ran off the stage <laughs> i don't mean to laugh at her at her uh, at her issues there but that's funny <laughs> just run away <laughs> and the winner is oh no so now this is her talking about uh, getting the role. Mm-hmm. And she said, quote, I remember when Kazan wanted me for that picture. Daryl Zanuck said, she can't do that. She's a musical comedy actress. And Kazan said, oh, no, she isn't. I know her from Broadway. She's an actress. She can do almost anything, and I want her. So they got me, end quote. I like it. All right, we got two more quotes for her because I, I was, or no, three more. Uh, I was just enjoying this whole article that I read. I think the reason that these pictures that I was fortunate enough to make made such an impression was because the writers had a real sense of responsibility to the audience. They had a point. They were written for a reason. That seems to have gone out of style. I think she was, I think this, I can't remember when it was from. I want to say it was the 80s or the 70s or it's before 2000s. And I'm like, really? Mm-hmm. You thought the late 40s was when they were writing for a reason? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the only time. <laughs> Another quote, Gregory Peck wasn't much fun. You know, humor to me makes life possible, and there wasn't much of that, end quote. Maybe he just doesn't like you, buddy. <laughs> Actually, I, what I found is that pretty much everybody was like, I don't really like working with Gregory Peck That's on, this, on this movie. I hate finding out this stuff. <laughs> Keep it to yourself well, next time. Well, the thing I think, so the, here's my thought on it. He plays a guy who's just like angry all the time, pretty much in this movie. Mm-hmm. And then like, and like, he even says, I'm sorry for being so somber. I'm, you know, like, I don't wish I wasn't this way kind of thing. So I, part of me wonders if he was just like, this is the role I'm playing, mm-hmm. you know? And he was, yeah, might've been. So, all right. The last thing I have for, from this uh, article, from her quote here um, is about Elliot Kazan. Mm-hmm. He's a very interesting director. He's a secretive director. For instance, if he has a piece of direction for you, he'll whisper it in your ear so the other actors won't don't hear what it is. Then he whispers in their ears, and then you do the scene again, and you try to figure out what he said to them by what they do. Okay, that sounds exhausting, but that's okay. Right? So now we're going to move on to Elliot Kazan. So the last Best Picture nominee we discussed, Crossfire, a couple mm-hmm. of people that ref- were, we were talking about a couple of people that uh, refused to talk to the House on American Activities Committee, right? Mm-hmm. Including the director, Edward Dimitrik, who ended up getting blacklisted because of it. So this episode, we get Elliot Kazan. The House on American Activities Committee demanded that a cavalcade of Hollywood talents prove their patriotism by ratting out their communist colleagues, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Those even suspected of being party members, hundreds of people ranging from Polanski to Eric to actor John Garfield, who's in this oh, movie, yeah. were blacklisted. In 1952, Kazan named names. So many in the entertainment industry hoped that Kazan's summoning by the committee would help destroy the, ba- the blacklist because mm. social issues had been at the forefront of much of his work, right? Moreover, he was such a powerful and prominent figure that he might have been able to resist the committee's demands without fear for his career. Mm -hmm. But instead, well, I should say in his first appearance in January, he acknowledged that he'd been a member of the Communist Party from 1934 to 1936, but refused to name names. Mm -hmm. But in April, he returned, and this time with with a four square condemnation of what he called the party's police state attempts to control his work and named eight fellow members. Mm. And they included the playwright Clifford Odets and actors Morris Karnofsky and his, and his wife, Phoebe Brand. Uh, Morris's wife. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not uh, Elia, Elia, Elia. Yeah. Elia Kazan. Elia Kazan. I can, now I can, now I don't know. (laughs) You see, I was fucking around, and <laughs> I can't say it right now either. Um, people are going to be like, "What kind of movie podcast is this?" They don't even know Elliot Kazan, but like, <laughs> I was trying to be funny, and then I ruined it. So, hey, that's my life. I was trying to be. That's the name of my my autobiography. I was trying. I was to trying funny. to be funny, and I ruined it. And I ruined it. That's it. I like it. I like, ladies it. and gentlemen. 
So what's crazy is that the time published all eight names the next day. Yeah. So Kazan remained always an unrepentant informer. Two days after testifying, he took out a full page ad in the New York Times explaining his decision and calling on others to follow his example. Mm -hmm. He wrote that he had testified to protect his adopted country because he was born. He was actually born in what was then called Constantinople okay. um, to Greek parents. <clears throat> Quote, from a dangerous and alien conspiracy. So the U.S. could, quote, still keep the free, open, healthy way of life that gives us self-respect. I believe that the American people can solve this problem wisely only if they have the facts about communism. All the facts. So this same year, he filmed On the Waterfront, mm -hmm. which was basically his effort to justify his informing. Mm -hmm. But I have a little bit more on that kind of a lot more but since we'll end up doing on the waterfront at some point in this series i'm going to leave that for potent notables for that edition of is that is that 54 54 yeah i believe so 54 um the reason i know it's 54 is hilarious but um that's okay um, well i know that it's 19 it's not 1950 i think i know exactly why is it quiz show quiz show which <laughs> yep. is another that's why i know because 1955 was marty Yep. And Ernest Borgnine won. I mean, like, it's crazy that that's so funny that we both know it because of Quiz Show. <laughs> Which we haven't even done yet. But anyway, no. Uh, I, I can say that I've read books about uh, about uh, characters who are communist at this time in American history, particularly, meaning the, uh, the 50s and beyond. Um, and it's actually kind of, actually not just America, but also I've read some where they're in Britain, but it doesn't matter. Um, there's a thing where it's around this time that all the information about Stalin and the gulags comes out and mm -hmm. people in America start to find out about it. And it's like, I mean, by, by which I mean really come out, like, you know, it's like peace people really start to find out. And like, there was a lot of disillusionment because they were thinking that, you know, that things were going well in the Soviet Union and they find right. out people were being murdered. And there was a lot of people to my understanding, and I don't, I don't know anything about it really, but, um, you know, a lot of people were like, well, but now what, you know, like I, I can't, I can't in good conscience support this. So I think a lot of people had like a turnaround kind of, kind of moment. Right. Exactly. That's exactly what it is, is once they learned how awful you know, mm -hmm. the Soviet Union really was, they were like, well, okay, I guess that's done for me now. Yeah. And like, and then you feel stupid for having, um, you know, ever supported such a thing. Yeah. Still waiting on some people to come around for a similar scenario. Well, yeah, there's two there's two like ways of going about that, just ways of being that people, you know, responses people naturally have. And one is the one I would have where I feel like a fucking idiot and hate myself. Right. Um, and like or I, there's the others that cling to it and just cling to it because they ra yeah. rationalize it away. They can't deal with having been so wrong, which is what some people might be doing currently right now. Let's move on. Yeah. Well, many were concerned that this film would somehow lend credence to the conspiracy theory prevalent at the time among the political right, that mm -hmm. Jewish friendly films and novels from the time were inspired by communism or were intentionally made as communist propaganda, which is hilarious mm -hmm. when you think about it, because, you know, which they didn't know at the time, but like, yeah, Stalin, communist, they didn't like the Jews. Mm hmm. Which is real shocking because historically there's been so many people who have been who have liked the Jews. I know they're usually such a likable bunch. Well, actually, they're likable. They are likable, but they are a, why, what is it? why are there so many conspiracy theories with them? It goes all it goes back a long, long way, and I don't know why. Um I I, I think it's an explanation to to abuse them, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, but like I it's hard to say exactly why they got, you know, picked on quite so hard. Well, I, th I, so I look at it like this, right? They were slaves in Egypt. Yeah. And they were different because they believed in one God. Right. And, um, I think that, that, that basically there was a lot of like, they're terrible because, you know, they wanted to enslave and they want people to rationalize enslaving another human. Mm -hmm. Right. And if they're less than human, then it's okay. Right. Which is mm -hmm. why for years, you know, we had so many 
terrible things said about black people and how they were inferior and everything because we needed to rationalize enslaving them. Mm -hmm. And then that still um, perpetuates to today. And I think that for Jews, unfortunately, it's just thousands of years more. Yeah. And then, of course, it just becomes in, ingrained in people that, oh, the Jews have been a problem since forever. Right, exactly. And then, you know, you just find, and it, it's just when you already have that, it's an easy thing to point a stick at, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, like, oh, people, we need people on our side. Let's tell them the Jews fucked everything up for them. Yep, it's an easy, an easy way to manipulate people. Yep. Well, anyway, so, um, so that fear was kind of legitimized somewhat when uh, many of the people involved with the film were brought before the House on American Activities Committee. What a surprise that people from this film were, right? Mm -hmm. Which, um, including the producer, Daryl F. Zanuck, Anne Revere, Elliot Kazan, and John Garfield. Mm -hmm. so, That's a lot. Yeah. I, can you I can't even imagine being called in front of the government for this. You know what I mean? I made a movie where I thought Jew, where I argued Jewish people are people, and you're yeah. getting brought before Congress. I'm like, motherfucker! It's, I would have. It's ended really up, disgusting. Yeah, I would have ended up in then Guant Guantanamo, whatever it was, whatever we had and, then for that. That would have been me because I'd have been like, "What the fuck are we doing?" And like, people and, are like, "No, you wouldn't." It's like I would do that tomorrow if they did that to me. So, and this is what you know, I don't understand about this whole like movement of like, you know, you're you can't like just tell kids that America's bad, you know, like yeah. we've done a lot of bad shit, and yeah. you need to learn from it or else you just repeat it. Mm -hmm. I don't. How can like how can you see something like this and be like, yeah, but that was it was still America, so it was good. It's good. America yeah, did it. It's good. Like, why Slavers, make anyone feel we were bad nice about to slaves? Things. Yeah, exactly. Oh, good. Oh, good lord! With the slavery things you have to—I have to stay off of social media and slavery because every so often a South, the South didn't secede because of slavery thing comes up on whatever sites I'm on. Oh and my I, god! I'm, I'm, I just I'm like CJ from uh, that meme of CJ from uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Oh shit! Here we go again! And I just go right in. I just <laughs> dive front. For, oh! And you actually get people who are say, you know, most people in the South weren't even slave owners. Only some were. It's like, oh, only some were. Never mind. It's fine. Oh, if only well, some, were. Just some. I didn't realize it was yeah. some. Yeah, I thought it was everybody. Otherwise, I that I was gonna be mad, but now I'm fine. <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> well, so uh, John Garfield accepted the role. Oh, I already. I think I already said this, but uh, well, I'll say it again. So he accepted the role after producer Daryl F. Zanuck promised that the film would be faithful to Moss Hart's script. And despite his limited role, Garfield was paid a full star salary. Um, hmm. Well, well done, after this, John. yeah. But after this, is he was brought before you know the House on American Activities Committee twice and was blacklisted, and then he was taken off the blacklist and then put back on it again. And it was believed that the stress of these experiences led to the heart attack that killed him at the age of thirty nine. Oh my God, he's a year younger than us. Yeah. And he died of a heart attack. I mean, I'd be stressed out too, frankly, because like you can't work and stuff. And then also just being in front of Congress is stressful. And yeah. also, uh, fuck everybody. Like, what? <laughs> He's like, stop playing with my emotions, taking me on this <laughs> list and then taking off, off this list. Well, so to get things back to a less serious note, because um, yeah. it's been kind of a, a heavy wade through the boat notables here. Well, it's kind of a heavy um, movie, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, it is. So, Gentleman's Agreement was the only Best Picture Oscar nominee of 1947 to have an Oscar nomination for Best Actor, and it is also the only Best Picture nominee to be nominated for Best Actress as well. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of crazy. So, yeah. I don't know. I just thought that was really interesting. A lot of their Best Picture nominees didn't have a lot of great acting, according to the Academy. Well, they're so, right. The last one. When Daryl F. Zanuck stood on the Oscar podium, picking up his Academy Award for Best Picture, he said, quote, I should have won this for Wilson, end quote, which he made in 1944. That's a... <laughs> all righty. Just, I, you know, I wish... I don't know if they were filmed at all back then. I imagine they weren't televised, but I can just imagine the audience being like, oh, yeah, what the fuck? 
What did he just say? <laughs> you should have won this for something else. Yeah. All righty. <laughs> you dickhead. <laughs> right. Uh, I just thought that was funny. All right. Well, that's the potent notables. Um, there was a lot more than I was expecting to get for this one. Yeah. Well, it's a whole thing. Although there wasn't as there wasn't anything as juicy as uh, as crossfires. <laughs> yeah, the fucking <laughs> the lady that uh child rape. You know? Yeah. <laughs> what have you? Banged your uh, 13-year-old step stepson and then married him nine years later. Yeah. And then had a kid with him when she also had a kid with the kid's father. So kid's he was father, the yeah. stepfather and half brother to I love the idea that she married him nine years later. She's like, Well, I'm gonna wait to marry him. I'm not horrible. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. <laughs> we, I mean, we fucking, but like I'll wait to tie the knot. Um, so that's fun. Hey, so, um, what do you think? Is it, you think it's kind of weird? I've been thinking how it's a little strange to me and I can't really put my finger on exactly why, but, um, our first two movies of this year were Christmas movies and our second two deal with anti-Semitism. I know. I didn't I, know that was, I had no idea that's what was going to happen going into Yeah, that. It just felt like, okay. I've, and We've got like, some themes here. I guess so. But like. Fortunately, the two Christmas movies aren't anti-Semitic at all. So, <laughs> well, they, they aren't necessarily anti-Semitic, but I wouldn't say that they're like, you know, hooray for Jews! <laughs> <laughs> hooray for Jews! <laughs> well, that's the potent notables. So let's go on to the movie overview. Movie overview. What is with these early movies and having like the soundtrack be crazy loud right out of the gate? You get a you get a ton of score right away. They want to yeah. really hit you with the score. But it's they, like always like a trumpet or a horn or something right in the beginning. You know, I I actually might guess that it's a it's a it's a I mean movies had been in sound for a while at this point, but it's like a holdover from like a um hey, the movies in we have sound kind of thing. <laughs> Isn't this exciting? Yeah, it's out. And everybody's like, oh, do, 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 do. and they're excited. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, or maybe that's just, I don't know. I, got nothing. I, I mean, it's as good a reason as any. I think it makes sense. I kind of wonder exactly when it is that the uh, credits switch to being at the end of the movies primarily. Because so much credit at the beginning of movies in the olden days, and then less so and less so. And now we get, I don't know, half an hour of credits at the end now. I know. It's interesting. Well, also, did you notice that in the credits, screenplay was two words? Um, I love it when I see little little anachronism. Well, it's not an anachronism, but little old timeisms like that. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. Like even when I typed it in here, you know, Mike or Google, because it's on Google Docs, Google was like, that's not right. You've got that spelled wrong. <laughs> it's not two words. No, it had, yeah. <laughs> well, it's like when you read old timey newspapers and it says baseball, two words. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. All right. So we've got a widowed guy and he's talking to his kid about the, the chick who, the lady who died, right? And I guess grandma is saying that he's getting harder and harder to have around the house. Mm hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think he's... goes to show that Gregory Peck was playing a character here. Yeah, exactly. Your father's a pain in the ass, Tommy. <laughs> was his name Tommy? I think it was. No. Oh, the kid. Yeah, the kid's name is Tom. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're like, Gregory Peck was Phil. Yeah. Slash Skyler. Skyler. <laughs> Green slash Greenberg. Yeah, whichever. So, you know, they're having this whole conversation, right? And, you know, he's, he's finding more and more about... Uh, what grandma is telling little Tommy here. Mm -hmm. And then he says, looks like I'm going to have to slug grandma. Like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Domestic violence against your own elderly mother, just right out the gate. That's... <laughs> Who, by the way, was only actually 12 years older than Gregory Peck. Oh, well, that's Hollywood for you. <laughs> yeah. He's an, an eligible young bachelor. She is a grandmother who's almost dead. <laughs> who and who almost, almost dies multiple times throughout the movie. <laughs> um, now we're gonna meet his mom here, and uh, we get some excellent line delivery between Peck and his mom. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hope it's what you want, and it's not too far. 
<laughs> and it's weird how like not nicely they speak to each other. Yeah. I feel like I feel like this movie was going for Aaron Sorkin before Aaron Sorkin. You know? <laughs> it's like some zippy dialogue. Kind yeah, of. they were like trying to have zippy dialogue, but it just was like I don't know. I just felt like the director was like, say the lines quick. And they were just like, mm. okay, I will say them quickly. Now you <laughs> now you talk. Now you talk. Now you talk. We did it. <laughs> well done, everyone. Movie over. <laughs> I mean, probably the nicest interaction is between dad, you know, dad to kid, you know, mm -hmm. Phil to, to Tom here. But dad to grandma and grandma to grandson are pretty combative. Yeah. Well, you know, they're sick of each other's shit. <laughs> I was thinking, I was like, why is his mom even in New York? He was just talking about how he was born in California and raised in California, mm -hmm. been there his whole life. But now his now his mom's in New York. What's yeah, he just brought but, his mom into New York with him, I guess. Right. Well, I didn't know that. But he does say that in a little bit. But uh mm -hmm. So now he's he's gonna head to the magazine office, right? I guess it's Smith's magazine or something was the name of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's like, oh, "I'm here to see Mr. Minifee." They're like, "That way." And then we linger on the the receptionist for a little mm -hmm. bit, and then this guy steps right in front of the camera, yeah. in between the camera and her. And I'm like, "This is really weird." <laughs> Some odd framing or whatever, but hey, I'm not a I'm not an Oscar winning director. So, um, then he gets over to the area that Mr. Minifee is at, and uh, it's like, she goes, or I can't even, maybe this was the receptionist who says it, I don't know, but Mr. Minifee is on the long distance, which I thought was adorable. Um, it comes, it comes, oh, remind me to mention later about phones. Okay. Of course, you don't know when it comes up, but <laughs> yeah. now, now that I said now that I said that out loud, I uh, I I'll remember. And now this is when you know when he ex explains why his mom's there because he's like, oh, I took my mom and, mm -hmm. and my kid. So, okay. And uh, already, I'm just like, man, the acting is very stilted in this. It's very just like herky jerky. It does feel a little bit that way, um, particularly Peck. Um, yeah. I don't assume we played it that way on purpose because I don't know. I've I've always liked him and thought he was a good actor, but I don't know. John Garfield was kind of doing the same thing here. Mm -hmm. That's very manner. I get it. And Anne Murray mm -hmm. plays his mom. Mm -hmm. Did it a lot too. Anyway, so. <clears throat> I was th I was thinking this was sort of fascinating because uh, Dorothy McGuire, who plays, uh, you know, I don't remember her name now, but the niece of Mr. Minifee, Kathy, Kathy, Kathy Lacey, Miss Lacey. Yep, she uh, she's a divorcee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't that fun? I'm curious what the Legion of you know <laughs> Good Order or whatever the hell it was who thought of this one because they didn't <laughs> like Miracle on 34th Street. <laughs> They were like, this is fine. <laughs> okay. I, just, I wasn't expecting that, but already. No, they um, were probably like, this is, you don't even, I don't, we don't even need to watch this. It's about anti Semitism. They yeah. say the Jews are on equal ground as Christians. So, no, no this is no. all wrong. Absolutely not. Um, they didn't even have time to get to the divorce or anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's fun. And uh, so Lacey is her uh, ex husband's name, and she's still going by it, but she's Miss Lacey. It's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> And the ex-husband is just there. They're hanging out. It's like, okay. It's a little bit like when uh, Howard Hughes goes to goes right. to uh, Catherine Hepburn's house. It's, Something people yeah. used to do, just invite their ex, ex spouses over? I, don't know. I guess so. Do? I don't know. Now, we're going to have a discussion about him, his, you know, Skylar versus Phil, right? Mm -hmm. We were, And um, he's like, oh, Skylar's just my writing name, which it's kind of a cool name. Mm -hmm. Skylar. Yeah, it is. Um, Skylar Green. And then the Mr. Minifee's like, I wouldn't call a dog Skyler. Like, yeah. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and Phil's like, okay, fuck you. Jeez. I'm like, it's my fucking name. <laughs> Is that when he says it's my mother's name? Yeah, exactly. And, and then, by the um, way, I like the uh, the thing that people used to do where they used to give some first initial. The yeah, the the their oh. the mother's maiden name is a middle name. I didn't know. That used, that, is that a thing they used to do? I didn't know that. Yes, it, it happened somewhat frequently. I don't know if it was really frequently, but yeah, you hear about it every so often. I think it's kind of neat. 
because it like what a middle name doesn't matter anyway you know so right. uh may as well and it's like a nice way of keeping the mother's family as part of it of course i guess you don't need to take a husband's name and name the children that anyway but you know so i i enjoyed that he was like yeah you know like somerset w somerset mom and sinclair lewis you know i was like i know somerset mom mm. and sinclair <laughs> lewis but i've read somerset mom i know them both personally they were dicks <laughs> they were dicks um and I was like kind of looking at this scene, you know, I'm watching him talk to uh, Dorothy McGuire here and he's kind of got this little smile going while he's talking to her. I'm like, damn, that's a handsome guy. Mm -hmm. It's like a really good looking dude. I think he's better looking than Gary than Cary Grant. I can see that he's uh, he's quite handsome and he's, you know, got the got the build from that. Everybody loved back then, you know, tall and broad. Yeah. <laughs> I like tall broads too. No, no, no. It's tall and broad. <laughs> ah, okay. I like that too. Okay, fair. I thought Dorothy McGuire is attractive too. She has kind of like a she's very small. I feel like she was smaller than what uh they liked back then. <laughs> he was you know large, I mean? he was small, opposites attract. <laughs> so anyway, we're gonna cut back to uh to Phil's apartment here, you know, and um they're having breakfast. <laughs> Which of course means the mom is just making a bunch of food for everybody. Yeah. While they sit there and you know contemplate and read the funnies in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. But I was like, hey, they're eating grape nuts. They're eating grape nuts, and I don't know if you noticed, forty percent bran was the other cereal. They I had didn't there. see that. That's hilarious. So the kid, his his meal was grape nuts and forty percent bran. So he was regular. You know what I mean? That was regular. <laughs> Just imagine uh, that is not like a kid cereal combo that you would have today. No kid would would take that. Can you imagine the first kid, like the kid right at the cusp, where at the beginning of their childhood, when they're young but old enough to remember, they have to eat grape nuts and forty percent bran, and like a banana in it is like a treat. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then they're a little bit older but still kids, and that's exactly when like, they're like fifteen. Moms. Yeah, yeah. Like the 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 new cereal cereal two point drops. <laughs> and it's all fucking fruity pebbles and what I know fruity pebbles is not that old, but that's not the point. Sugar insane insanity. And can you just imagine, oh my god, where is this been? <laughs> can I go back to being a kid? This is the greatest thing ever. And then you know their teeth all fall out when they're 20. So of course that was the case in general, anyway. It's not like you were safe from teeth falling out just because you had brain. <laughs> right. Um I think so. Now we're going to have this whole discussion about anti Semitism because he's talking about this. That was the assignment that he was given by mm -hmm. Mr. Minifee. And, um, and he's like, he's like really struggling to explain anti Semitism. And he talks about Protestantism, Catholicism, and Judaism. Mm -hmm. no, no other religion. That's it. Islam? No. <laughs> Hinduism? Nope. Buddhism? Not, Not a thing. Scientology? That's okay. Just as it has to be. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm like, I don't think that explaining anti-Semitism would be that hard. Yeah. I didn't feel like it either. It felt like he was overcomplicating it a little. Yeah. I was like, well, there's people who believe in the Jewish faith and all the other people don't like that. <laughs> of course, which, then you get the which little, isn't good, which isn't good. Yeah. You get the little kid question. Well, why don't they like that? And then it's always, I don't fucking know. <laughs> like that. I have no answer to, but they don't. So now he's talking to his mom and, you know, we've got some acting choices that are being made here, you know, to like, <laughs> to like stay busy type thing. Mm -hmm. um, his mom takes his hat and starts dusting it. <laughs> <laughs> Can't go out with a dusty hat. And she dusts it for like the entire conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? Why is she dusting his hat? <laughs> and then she stops dusting his hat. To look meaningfully off in the distance as she says, you know, the kids are decent to start with, but, you know, like, basically, like, maybe there'll be a day when anti-Semitism won't be a thing mm -hmm. looking off in the distance. And I'm just like, wow, we're making some choices here. We're making some choices. Hey, I liked them. I thought that worked. Actually, I thought it was fine. <laughs> really? Oh. Yeah, a lot of the acting wasn't bothering me much at all at this point. So 
now he's going to go back to Mr. Minifee, you know, after he's had some thoughts and he's talked to his, you know, his mom and everything. And he's like, you know what? I really do want to do it. Okay. I'm going to need to talk to the facts and figures guys. Yeah. And the editor's like, I don't want facts and figures in this. I yeah. want entirely opinion. You know? And, and it was like very fun. Well, he was, he was anticipating what papers would become. And, uh, I liked how uh, like aggressive he weirdly was with it. I need your facts and figures, guys. No, you the fuck don't. Whoa, yeah, I, I know. Like, <laughs> just, yeah, really. just wanted to look something up, but I guess not. I I even wrote the editor seems to be very angry angry with Skyler, and really? I'm not sure why. Yeah, I don't know what he did, but whatever. Now the next thing that we're going to talk about is uh is is Dorothy McGuire, Kathy here, or somebody? No. It, I don't know who it was. I think it was Kathy. Kat, Kathy? Kathy. Fucking Jesus. Ooh. She says something about Vassar. And I'm like, first Grape Nuts, now Vassar? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wrote this movie. Um, this is a movie for Zach. Yeah, absolutely. I got that, too. I love when people mention Vassar in, in media. It's where it's where rich girls from the city used to go. Yep. They still do. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> Not, don't let that get back to any students, but true. <laughs> um, I think the conversations between Ms. Lacey and Mr. Green are kind of the most enjoyable so far. Yeah. Oh yeah, they have they have a good rapport. I like it. And they're so they they're out at a restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. And then he's just like, "Want to dance?" And there's like a bunch of people dancing. Did this happen? Because this used to be a movie thing that like happened up until maybe the two thousands. Yeah, dinner and dancing. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. But, like, the idea is so foreign to me now. Like, I just, I have never seen anybody dancing at a restaurant. Have you? No. But then again, I don't go to dancing club restaurant places. Is that even a thing, is my point? Um, That's a good question. You ask many difficult like, questions. I don't. I feel like now it's like you either go to a restaurant or you go to a club. That's, yeah. Very true. And you don't necessarily do that kind of dance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, not for that kind of dancing. It's like, listen, you can either sit quietly and eat and have a quiet conversation, or you can fucking take ecstasy and grind on people for that's a it. Hours. Though. What are the two? No in between. Nope. Absolutely not. What if I want to talk you loudly want... <laughs> and grind while eating? No. You want to slow dance? Go back in time and go back to middle school. I slow dance a lot of the time because I go to I go to well, things you go that are, to dancing classes. Yes, specifically, and we have parties where you get to dance. Like that's why they have parties at the dancing school I go to that are just because nobody has a chance to dance like for real outside of lessons because it's that's not what the I olden mean. days. But uh, it should be the olden days. It'd be much better. Well, it shouldn't be the olden days. Never mind. Let me let me <laughs> let me amend that fucking statement. But uh, yeah, it'd be nice if nobody knows how to dance anymore. So it'd be useless, you know. I think it'd be great to go back to like 18, like 61, you know, just like right just before the Civil War started. So um, you can get that last gasp of greatness when America gotcha. was really great. Um. Okay. <laughs> I think we should go back to 1861 BC. That was yeah. That's the last time Egypt was great. Exactly. That's more relevant for this movie. So, um, <laughs> the so she's gonna. We got another working girl here because mm -hmm. you know Ginny was a working girl in Crossfire, and now Ms. Lacey is a working girl. Yeah, these women being miss and working, eh, it's not no good. I know it's interesting. They're showing a lot of women working in these movies, though. Of course, never in very high positions. Yeah, definitely not. Um, because they really should just be in missionary position. Oh my um, god! <laughs> <laughs> but I'm the one with my with my uh, Holocaust joke. Yeah, actually, that was worse. Sorry, the Holocaust one was worse. <laughs> I, uh, think was, I think that's definitely the case. Um, well, so yeah, we're gonna Ms. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's Miss Lacey. Is what we're talking about. Well, we're gonna leave Miss Lacey, the working girl. We're gonna mm. leave her. We're gonna go back to uh, you know Phil's apartment here, and he's just slaving away and you know he's typing and then he's throwing it out and he's typing and he's throwing it out and he's like ah, i'm licked i'm licked i tell you and man i guess i you know i shouldn't be a writer anymore and his mom says you wouldn't make a nickel at anything else 
Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, he's she, she, at least she's saying he's making a nickel at writing. You know, she could say, "Well, you're worthless every way." And he'd be like, "Yeah." Oh. Um, he's very much movie writing, where it's like because writing isn't an active, you know, thing. Oh, I know. I know. So he's like, oh, I'm moving around, doing things." And meanwhile, like, even if you're having trouble writing, I feel like when you're actually you're writing, pretty you're just much just there. still sitting there, yeah, <laughs> staring into space. The only action is like, hmm, is there something else I could be doing that could distract me from this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just going to do something else with my life. <laughs> but have we noticed that, I mean, at this point, I, I can't remember what she was dusting. It was like she was dusting a wall or something. But she was just, every scene, she was dusting something. <laughs> she's just compulsively dusting things that don't need to be dusted. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what are you dusting here? We dust the inside of the toilet. Because, you know, dust usually falls on things that are completely vertical. <laughs> this is some very persistent dust we have here. <laughs> Maybe she's just got a nervous condition. <laughs> Who can blame her? And then, so we're going through these, like, whole things. Like, oh, I've got it. I'll, I'll, I'll get into the headspace of my friend Goldie. Yeah. You know? And, oh, no, that won't work. I, how could I write him this letter? This is just, it's just not going to work. Um. And then he's like, oh, hey, I didn't think about how it would feel to be a Jew. <laughs> no one's ever thought of that before. I I was just like, what is going on here? We, just like, it's it's like goes fine for a while. And then all of a sudden we just get into these like terrible acting interactions. Mm. I th- again, I thought it was okay. It was perhaps a bit a bit obvious. And, but Well, now his mom's going to have... Uh, heart attack or something <laughs> yeah angina that's what she has yeah. not true angina false angina false angina just <laughs> like her vagina <laughs> which um, is what a lot of republicans get angry about in dressing in uh, changing rooms false exactly angina. false they only false want they only vagina. want true anginas in there <laughs> um how I, I just i never realized pain could be so sharp so so tell us how you really felt about the acting in a lot of this movie. I don't know how you're not seeing this. Like I, I was like, how? I w- I was expecting you to be like, yeah, this no, is not good acting. No, I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm not seeing it at all. Just it's not really bothering me much. It's just, oh, sort of the world of this movie is painting. Everybody acts stupid. You know, you know what it is too, and this is probably what hurts me with the uh, the potent notables and looking stuff up beforehand. Mm-hmm. So I knew that like every person in this got nominated for an acting. Oh yeah, so role. you're like, hmm, I'm expecting gonna... really good acting, and a I'm great just ensemble like ensemble cast, but nope. yeah. And I'm like, first of all, that woman who played the mother got fucking nominated. <laughs> you didn't like her. No, she was fucking awful. The she whole me, movie. I thought she was good. She had me convinced that false angina was true angina, and that's not oh, hard. That's not easy to do. That's a good. That's a good point. I guess I'm being too harsh. Well, well I bet people are looking forward to the rank. Um, yeah. So now Tommy is going to go to his dad and be like, "Is she going to die?" Mm-hmm. And he's like, "Yep, <laughs> sure is, Tommy." I was like, what? How is that the response? Someday she's going to die. Could be right now. Who knows? <laughs> this not giving Tommy nightmares. Yeah, exactly. All of us I... are going to die someday, Tommy. All of us. Yep. Tommy's like, ah! <laughs> you get a gun around me right now, you might find uh, one dead dad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, the kid's mom died, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, all right. So the other thing that was very striking to me is everybody smoking. Mm-hmm. Just oh, yeah. everybody smoking all the time. I actually noticed this too right here because the doctor comes out and he's like, "Yep, she's got heart disease." Yes, let me <laughs> light up. <laughs> like obviously, light up this big cigarillo I have. I was like, "Wow." <laughs> yeah, just, I, I don't know if did they not know or I don't I don't know if they knew at this point or not. I just I don't know how you don't know. You know. Yeah. Yeah, if I feel like I don't know. Well, I know tobacco companies went out of their way to make people think that it didn't. Well, they said it was like healthy for people. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you're right. The people who don't die of cancer are somewhat healthy, I guess. Yeah, they just have emphysema. Mm -hmm. So um, now I thought this was kind of fun. He goes into into her room again, and she's like, "No need to look like Hamlet." 
mm-hmm. which is fun because that's next year's Oscar winner for Best Picture. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> no need to look like Hamlet and go winning any Oscars. No, they do anyway. <laughs> but now we get some more amazing peck acting. I'll, <laughs> I'll be Jewish. Is that the name of it now? Peck acting? Particularly. Peck acting. Is what Partic- it is. Pick acting. <laughs> sounds like a sounds like a rooster. Um, pick acting. Yep. Yeah. It's it's actually uh, how Hillary learned to swank. So. <laughs> okay, with pick acting. Yeah. Is that is that the name of a uh, of a new movie that we're going to be making at our production studio? How Hillary got her swank. <laughs> how Hillary learned to swank. That's no, it. it's going to be pick acting. Pick acting. Yeah. Okay. How Hillary got her swank. I like that better than uh, learn okay. to swank. I, I gotcha. That's we're gonna start working on that immediately, which is never. <laughs> oh, all right. So, um, I was actually curious at, the, at this point: is it the dialogue or the acting? You know, like mm-hmm. is is it is it they're trying to pack too much in? Yeah, the dialogue's just, a bit stilted. Like, I know I'll be Jewish. Like, how do you how do you deliver that? You know, yeah, without, without coming off a little a little much. It did feel like the acting, though, to me a little bit. Like, you know, it's hard. It's hard because I'm not reading the script as I'm watching it, right? So it's hard to say. But well, I kind of wonder if the characters have enough enough depth that the actors aren't able to really get much purchase into their performances because the the act that it's like all speeches about how anti-Semitism is wrong, and it's like you're right, but like this character <laughs> isn't much more than the opinion that anti-Semitism is wrong. Like, is, there isn't so much to get a hold of. Maybe I'm overthinking it there, though. No, no, I, I think you're, I think you're onto something there. I do, I will say though, I love Gregory Peck's voice. Oh, I know he should have, he should have done voiceovers or acting or you know, know. whatever. Know. Okay, audio books, what they have back then? <laughs> they didn't have that. So they grew up in the wrong generation. I could have listened to his voice, tell me how to do. I, I would have like, <laughs> I would have just been like, okay, well, Greg says to do this, so yep. that's should what I'm doing. Download him for GPS, you know, instead of the Google Maps lady. Yeah, exactly. Who I hate. Always telling me what what to do. Who I hate. Is it because she's a woman? Who does she think she is? <laughs> Boy, she looks so now Dorothy or Kathy is gonna show up again, mm-hmm. right? At the at the house. Or not again, but she's gonna show up at the apartment. And then uh she just starts looking at a picture of Tommy for about I don't know, an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a reasonable amount of time, right? Yeah. And then we get to some old timey kissing. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> where it's just like, do you think it's possible for us to meld our skulls together? <laughs> if it isn't, let's try anyway. Yeah. And we're Why already you... talking marriage. I know they've known each other for five seconds, and they're like, they get really serious really fast. Imagine doing that today. I just, I just would love it. First of all, you've known someone like you've been on one date once and you try to kiss them that way. You grab them like harshly by the arms and pull them in. And then yeah, just, like, and shove smash your face directly. Face and, yeah, just... and then you're like, well, we're getting married next week, right? Just see how they, just see how this person reacts to that. Well, if they react well, I guess you're a match made in heaven. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Just one person never had the will to, to, you know, stand up for themselves in these matches. Oh, boy. Well, yeah, it felt very quick. So, naturally, she was like, yeah, marriage. Is it crazy, though? Yeah, no, it's, it is crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll go crazy. And then we get, you know, he's like, is it Tommy that's, like, bothering you? What you're worried about? <laughs> Like, like no, him. it's been three days, dude. That's what's <laughs> worrying me. And then, and then he like, cause he, right, exactly. It sounds like he's like, cause I could just sell him. Yeah, you I know? don't even like him. I don't need much. to. Yeah, I don't need to keep him. Um, but then she was. Then her line is, "It's almost as if my marriage hasn't had my first marriage hadn't been wasted, because <laughs> apparently not having a kid means that the marriage was a waste." Mm-hmm. That makes sense to me. Yeah, I didn't get anything out of it, so I just okay. So. I did think it was, you know, it's sort of interesting, but I, I can, we go, so now we're going to go to this meeting that was contrived from the meeting with other movie producers, you know, mm-hmm. where they're like, don't do this because it's just going to bring unwanted attention. Right. Mm-hmm. It is. In, it's, I can I sort of understand why people wouldn't want him to do the story. Mm-hmm. Like I get, I can, I can understand where they're coming from, you know, mm-hmm. 
And I, I do think that this movie actually does a good job of showing like this guy can still just go back to being a Gentile, you know, mm -hmm. like you write this story and it's us that pay the price. Yeah. The story. So it's, I don't know. I just think that was kind of interesting. No, that, I get, I get it. <clears throat> but now we're going to meet his secretary. Miss mm -hmm. Wales. Is, yeah. Miss Wales. Who's quite attractive. <laughs> is that all you think about? I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean a lot, but not all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I was just, but I was thinking like, I don't know, look, maybe I'm just a cretin, but like, <laughs> here's my blind spot. Um, but like, to me, I would have a hard time with having a super hot secretary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that has been the, the downfall of many a businessman. Yeah. At least if it comes or anything to go by, which obviously <laughs> are. Well, I just, I don't know. M maybe you don't feel the same way, but like, and I'm not saying like, well, because obviously she would be attractive to me and therefore we'd fuck, you mm -hmm. know. I don't mean, I, I would just, would it would be just, I would feel guilty that I'm looking at this pretty girl you know, mm -hmm. and then I would feel guilty that I'd have any power that I have power over her. And I'm looking at her that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just, I just, it would not, I, I wouldn't like it. Miss <laughs> Wales isn't for you. We'll get you, uh, we'll get you some, you know, some matronly old, old lady. No, I think, I think I need a, <laughs> I think I need a guy, you know? Oh, I gotcha. I understand perfectly. Wink, wink. <laughs> I'll find you just the right guy. Did you say twink twink? Because that's I said what twink I'm twink. For. Exactly. I knew just what you meant. <laughs> um. <laughs> so yeah, now now we're gonna find out that she's Jewish, and she's like, "Yep, I changed my name to work for the magazine." So mm -hmm. that's that's so liberal, you know. Yeah. Which I thought was kind of was kind of interesting. And no, then, actually, um, I really like, in a sense. I mean, we'll we should probably talk about it later, but I really like the way. A lot of this movie actually points out, you know, people who act like they aren't racist or anti-Semitic or whatever, they kind of like don't put their money where their mouth is a lot of the time. Right. I liked that they did that, too. I think that this movie does a really great job of show, sort of showing all the facets of it. Mm -hmm. It's not just like, yeah, right. If you go to the, the, Ku, the Ku Klux Klan, you'll see a lot of anti-Semitism and racism, yeah. you know? But that's not where it needs to be fixed because those people are, for the most part, unfixable, mm -hmm. and they're a minority. So, anyway, um, now now he's going to go to see the doctor, and the doctor's like, "Well, you know, mm -hmm. this is a good one. He doesn't overcharge for just mm -hmm. sitting around, you know." Mm -hmm. And then he's like, "Would you say that if he wasn't Jewish?" And I just, you know, to me, it's like. And then he's like, because I am Jewish. Mm -hmm. I just was like, okay, this feels this feels weird, this moment. So I would have liked to have seen this interaction happen before he was deciding to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. Like, would he have noticed? Would he have said anything? Was this something that was going on constantly and that he just pushed, you know, brushed aside? Mm -hmm. But now making this decision, he's noticing it. I it just it feels out of place to me. Um, I kind of but agree. Not everybody's anti anti semitic. Like know. yeah, like he's just immediately encounters anti semitism everywhere. Like whereas he hadn't before, you know. Right. Ex that's exactly what I'm getting at. Thank you for putting it in a much better way. Well, I also feel like he's going out of his way to like say, "How do you feel about Jews anyway?" Yeah. Not right. Like, oh, <laughs> hey. So you don't like them, right? That's what I assumed about you. And I just feel like people are like, well, I don't know. I just wasn't thinking about it until you brought it up. So um, he feels rather confrontational in a, in a sense. And like constantly, constantly confrontational. Yeah. And I don't feel like I would, uh, if I was reading this, like if I was taking him seriously here, I'd be like, well, you kind of went out of your way to find like, yeah, yeah. to like even goad people into mentioning how they're anti-Semitic when they might not have otherwise, which doesn't mean that they weren't, but it's like, is this really how everyone's life goes? I don't know. Maybe it is. Yeah. I also think, think it was oh, I think I think Goldberg says it later, even. Is it Goldberg, his friend? Goldman. Goldman. Um where I think he even says, like, you know, you're packing it all in a lot, like a lot all at once. Whereas <laughs> we don't go through our lives like, you know, constantly. Hey, you are you anti-Semitic? 
Right. I actually was glad that they said that. I think it. I, I think it sort of grounds the movie having somebody say say something like that. Because yeah, I think so. It's true, but at the same time, you know, he also is being like going out of his way, which I think is not the point. And um, I did think it was interesting the idea that like they decide that he's going to be Jewish, and then he, apparently the word got around that he was Jewish. Yeah, immediately everybody's like, "Oh, did you hear?" <laughs> I know. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe this is true of the 40s, but I can't imagine working somewhere where everybody is talking about whether or not you're Jewish. Yeah, you know? I don't know. It, it's actually, it would be, I'd almost like, you know, because I don't have like sociological information about the time and maybe maybe it's accurate. I don't know because <laughs> I wasn't alive in 1947. I don't know if anyone knew that. Yeah. But anyway, she tells the story about how like she did it, you know, an application, two different applications mm -hmm. for the same job at the company that she's working at now. And the non-Jewish name got, um, got hired. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that was like the, 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 the guy in charge of hiring was named Jordan, I guess, or last mm -hmm. name was Jordan. Yeah. Anyway, you know, I, you wouldn't have think, you wouldn't think of Michael as being a uh, <laughs> anti-Semite, but I don't know. Have you know? Had, did you notice that phase he went through, like in the two uh, thousands, when he tried to have a Hitler? Yeah, mustache? when he had the Hitler mustache. That's he was trying to tell point. us something secretly. <laughs> I like. I like how he. I think he was at a point where he's like, I can pull anything off. I'm that yeah. popular. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can't and pull that off. Bro. It didn't. Yeah. Nobody can pull that off. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's ruined. So now he he's having another meal with uh, with Miss uh, Miss Lacey here, mm -hmm. and. Which is more smoking. Can you imagine having a meal with somebody smoking now? Well, you know, I have to think that it would have actually been a little bit better back then. Not even if you didn't smoke, which you have a high likelihood of smoking, given that everyone did. You would just be so used to everything smelling like smoke everywhere. I feel like you wouldn't even notice it. You think so? Because, I mean, a lot of people smoked when we were kids. That's true. And I remember hating it when, it would, when I would be in a restaurant and smelling smoke. Hated it. Like, I didn't like going out to restaurants because I didn't want to be around smoke. That's interesting. I actually don't remember. I remember not, like, being against smoking because my parents were. I don't remember smelling it too much. But then again, I don't know. I'm, I, it's not something I thought of. It's always funny. Like, we were the last we were the last generation of people who had smoking or non-smoking options in restaurants. I know. I know. It went away when we were teenagers. I'm so glad that my kids don't have to uh, grow yeah. up with that. Um. Also, I love how in these movies they have kids, but they just are never with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the kids just exist as like a as like a theoretical object over there. Right. Hello, child. Anyway, goodbye. I like, mean, for instance, have we gotten to the point yet where he's like, "You can make your own breakfast, right, Tommy?" Goodbye, and Tommy's like yeah. crying until he's like, "Okay, I have this pan on the fire, and let me just try to break this egg." Yeah, and it's try like, to break the egg, and then he smiles like I was able to do it. Yeah, and I didn't burn the house down, which I might eventually because I'm a child. <laughs> You could take five minutes and make me eggs, which do not take long to make, Gregory Peck's character, but whatever. <laughs> uh, so, so now we're going to go back to work here. Um, mm -hmm. Well, actually, before we go back to work, it looks like we got some friction between Mr. and Mrs. Green here. Oh, yeah. Um, not that kind of friction. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> not the enjoyable friction. They are well um, lubricated. Perhaps <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we're getting the sense that he, it's like, there's some, there's, there's like anti-Semitism there, mm -hmm. but he, it's like, he can't quite put his finger on where it is. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, which I think was good. And they, you know, they really spell it out later, but, um, but anyway, we're going to go back to work and, uh, they're going to reprimand Jordan and they're going to put, put out an ad religion is of no consequence or whatever. Yeah, it's like that would make me not like I would just be like, well, I'm not interested in working here. Yeah, I are they like, even talking about religion? I didn't know what what what. Yeah, <laughs> are they trying to tell me it is of consequence? I don't understand. Yeah, we definitely don't mind Jews here. Yeah, were you exactly. weeping when you said that? Because yeah, like are you going to tell me to get into a place. shower? Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so. They should have gone with shower because getting into the oven, I just, it's I was immediately obvious, suspicious. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hold on a second. You don't usually cook people alive. Wait, <laughs> this is a Nazi place. Anyway. 
Uh, let's move on from that. <laughs> so now we're going to go straight to uh, to his office and his his new secretary is going to be like, did they really write that on there? Blah, blah, mm. blah. And then she starts being like, boy, I hope they don't hire the wrong ones because we don't want to be the fall guy for the kikey ones. I know. This was like, okay, wow. they. <laughs> this one, weird. it was an interesting thing they decided to do here with making other Jews culpable for anti-Semitism as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess, like, I get it. But at the same time, did it really need to be pointed out? Yeah, I don't know. I actually thought it was interesting, but I'm not... I don't know if it's 100% like necessary or accurate. I don't really know how often people uh, maybe they do. I don't know cuz you get I'm sure I mean, they do. You you get you know people who like want to belong to the in group so much in American politics that they, you know, they become like the one token whatever. Right. Um, so maybe it happened a bunch back then too, I don't know. But it did feel a little like she immediately goes to two kikey, like you know, like I know. I can kind of get she's like, like ah, it's just a word, you know. Yeah, I just I just used it to describe them, and he's like, yeah, it's what that's what it is. It's what yeah, that's like the whole that's what I'm saying to you. That's what I didn't like. Did yeah. you get it? <laughs> and then he's like, you know, I I don't want to hear words like that or the n word or anything else, else you know. <laughs> Which I, I was actually sort of okay with. You know, sometimes it's like sort of striking to hear somebody yeah. say the N-word, but in this context, it didn't feel quite as striking, yeah. you know? He's, he's saying not to say it. And, like, I don't know, there wasn't quite such a prohibition to saying it back then. It was just a slur that you shouldn't say. Right. Not quite so much the the, 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 the the forbidden word it is today. And... I also thought it was kind of crazy that he was lecturing a Jew about anti-Semitism. That was a Gentile. I was like, I don't know if this is your place. Yeah. Hey, you. Quit being racist against me. And she's like, wait a second, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Anne, Celeste Holm, is going to show up here. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's the, the financial wizard. <laughs> hey, why not? <laughs> <laughs> she's the fashion person here. Because, of course, you couldn't have a woman being in charge of any other division. Just fashion. Um, Thank you. Yeah, just fashion. And uh, and then he fashion invites her out nagging, to a... right? Yeah, exactly. Um, he invites her out to a bar. And I'm just yeah. like, doesn't this seem kind of odd? Um, yeah, it's actually really funny when we get to her reaction to his... Uh, she, she invites him to a party. And he's like, that's grand. Can I bring my girl? And she actually... Yeah reacts and it's like i'm actually on i'm with her on this because yeah. this didn't seem he definitely let her on rather flirtatious but uh whatever and i liked how he's he's their fiancés at this point but uh, can i bring my girl you know so now this guy's gonna show up while they're there mm -hmm. right and he's gonna be like you know you worked in pr right mm -hmm. and and then he does the 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 ubiquitous white guy line of oh I got plenty of friends who are Jew you know mm -hmm. um did you notice that Anne here Celeste Holm keeps calling him a drip um I think I did notice that I like it oh, what is that it's, it's just like a like a dope you know I think we should bring it back well we can't because now drip means you got a bunch it's like you got bling oh damn it. Oh, messed it up again. That's okay. And you know how I know that? Uh, because I hear that? it all the time whenever mm -hmm. I talk to Parker. Look at my drip. I got drip. Look at this drip. Drip. Oh, Lennon's got the drip on. Calvin's got drip. Um. So uh, what you're saying is you don't have drip is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I don't ever have any drip. <laughs> Just like any parent of a teenager, you don't have whatever the popular slang term is. Yeah, true. Um, so what I wrote here is to remind myself about what scene we were in, <laughs> yeah. I said the one of the many that green confront confronts about microaggressions because mm -hmm. he doesn't let anything go. No, he really doesn't. And like, and like we said, it's just suddenly every anti-Semite in New York is being drawn to him magnetically somehow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, so, so now, you know, he's going to go back and see, um, Kathy, because who gives a shit about his kid? And um, he's going to take her to the party, right? Mm -hmm. And he goes, I don't have to kiss you in public. I've got a nice dark taxi out there. 
Okay. <laughs> She's like, well, I'm not getting in that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you can you can bring Tommy if you want, but I ain't. I'm glad you didn't bring Tommy. Yeah, um, so cool. then you know she's like, when they get to the party, Kathy's like, "Am she really seems to like you?" Mm -hmm. And he's like, "Yeah, she's pretty. I, you know, she's I I like her. She's fun. Whatever. You know." Mm -hmm. And then she says, "I'll scratch her eyes out if she makes a play at you." Mm -hmm. I really enjoy it actually. I don't know why it just felt very like goofy. Okay, so <laughs> sorry. Now man. they're they're going to be introduced to to Professor Lieberman, yeah, a famous physicist. Yeah, who is this definitely just, Einstein. I was going to say he's just Einstein, except they called him Lieberman. It was fun because <laughs> it's like, yeah, give him the hair, the physicist hair. You know what I mean? It's like he's <laughs> he's like store brand, you know, Einstein. Yeah, and then they get into this whole discussion about you know zionism versus uh palestine and all this mm -hmm. other stuff i'll be honest with you i was i sort of got lost in it i was just like what are we talking about like <laughs> what side is he on i don't even understand what he's talking about yeah it's interesting because i'm not 100 percent sure what the debate was like back then of it um but i think he was trying to say do you uh are you talking about like thinking that the jewish people deserve to live somewhere or that the Palestinians should be removed from Palestine because one. Right, is just like but then where did he fall on that? Yeah, actually, I, I wasn't sure either because then he kind of went off on a weird thing about. Yeah, that's what I mean. He just, it like started out understandable, and then and then it got really convoluted and weird. Scientifically, I'm not Jewish, and they're like, "Oh, uh, yeah. I'm like, really? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like you have a lineage, if nothing else. I understand that like races are a social construct, which I didn't know they knew back then. So that was nice." But at the same time, like you know, you're you you are part of a, a heritage going back a long way. So, yeah. Well, I also thought it was kind of fascinating because you know Israel was created in 1948, so mm -hmm. oh, this is yeah. before Israel. So I thought that was kind of I was like, oh right, they wouldn't. This wouldn't. This would be a debate in the sense of like uh, you know, um, in the in the abstract, basically, mm -hmm. you know, because it hadn't happened. Not a not a topic we should probably touch too much, by the way. Given, yeah, right. Given the current atmosphere, but yeah. um, well, we get some more strife between Green and Lacey here, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, they've kind of yeah they have a lot of strife so far, and they've again it's they've known each other for three days or whatever, and yeah, it seems like they strife a lot. Yeah, it seems like not. Um, I don't know. I mean, if I was either one of them, I think I'd be like, I think I'm done with this. Yeah. Exactly. I, I would feel exactly the same way. I'm not even saying either of them is so much at fault, just as much as this isn't working. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I see where both of them are coming from because she's, she's being a way about it that is, you know, it's hard to put your finger on, but it's definitely not what he would want her to be mm -hmm. like, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then at the same time, it's like, you're just going to be mad at her all the time. Yeah. You know, and the other thing is for me, it was like, I get that I don't really love the way she's being either, you know, like I would be a little, eh, I'm not sure I want to be married to someone like that hundred percent. Right. But, but like from her perspective, he's basically saying, do you have a problem with me being Jewish? And she's over there, but you're not right. Exactly. You're not Jewish. I wouldn't so, have a problem if you, you were, but yeah. also you're not, you're Shut not. The fuck so. up. And, he, and just every time we pan back to him, he's more and more Jewish. He's got like the side locks and everything. Suddenly, <laughs> yeah, he's like exactly. a rabbi. Hold on a second. You you don't like me because I'm Jewish. And she's like, you're a coach. <laughs> you're losing your grasp on reality, Gregory Peck. <laughs> and he's just speaking in Hebrew. I mean, I have to say this is like a really fun parody scene that yeah. nobody would get in the mod. Like if we were to do it right now, we'd be like, what the fuck are they talking about? This is a strange, you know, touchstone like to, to, to be on. Like <laughs> you have to have seen the 1940, uh, what are we on, seven best picture winner in order to get this joke. <laughs> It'd be like, yeah. oh, but... um, so now his kid's going to come wake him up and he's going to jump up like he's going to fight somebody. Yeah, I know. This kid wakes him up and he's aggressive with it. He's yeah. Like, he's like ready to fight. I was like, like PTSD geez. from World War One or something? I don't know. Well, then we get an an interesting conversation between... I'm, I'm sorry. You know what it is? 
he assumes it's an anti-Semite waking him up. That's exactly what I thought. When I saw it, I was like, is he thinking that it's like an anti-Semite that's waking him up right now? He's like, son, do you have a problem that I'm Jewish? And the son's like, what? Did you wake me up because I'm Jewish? <laughs> if I was Christian, you would have let me sleep. Yeah. And then the kid's like, but I thought we weren't really Jewish. <laughs> confused this poor kid is confused and i feel bad for him well, actually he doesn't even know at this point whether yeah. or not he's jewish or not or whatever this is uh then oh, they're gonna have that conversation right. while he's in the shower mm -hmm. yeah where he keeps like looking out from the curtains with more and more soap on his face <laughs> in our in our parody nobody gets he'll just be continuously more so <laughs> beard so hair like mohawk yeah <laughs> suddenly the entire shower is just soap just bubbles from He's the kid's just there. like, do you think we could have had this conversation before <laughs> or after this? Yeah, I don't. I'm kind of weirded out. Um, and and then you know, well, the good news, the phone call was was Goldie Goldman. You know, mm -hmm. right? He's like, oh, Goldie. Well, he's very happy to hear from Goldie. Very excited about he's it. He's like, ah, oh, my fellow Israelite, Goldie. <laughs> Which I think is funny because when they first bring him up, it's like, oh, right. I was once friends with a guy that was Jewish. <laughs> yeah. But now he's like your best friend of all time. Yeah. He's so happy to hear from him. Like, Wait a second. I forgot I had a friend who was Jewish and now they're like blood brothers. Yeah, exactly. So the kid leaves. He tells the kid like, yeah, tell him you're Jewish. You're not, though. But just don't tell him that part. Just tell him you are. and Don't tell him the part that you're not. Yeah, <laughs> I like I, that's I like the music. No, it's confusing. And I like the idea that he's worried that, like, this kid at the schoolyard is going to, like, blab. <laughs> and yeah. the fact that he's not Jewish is going to get out. It's like, okay. Yeah, it's a little bit absurd. Um, well, actually, it's a lot of bit absurd. So now he's going to eat pancakes with his long-lost friend he's best friends with. And uh, they're just going to sit there and look at each other while mm -hmm. he eats pancakes and just kind yeah. of nod and smile. Like, that's, not what you, that's not what you do with your friends? No. Well, I do if they we're about to make love, maybe. Um, <laughs> that's it. And then he tells them what he's doing, and the, the <laughs> Goldie here goes, You fool! You crazy fool! <laughs> <laughs> Which, actually, he wasn't really all that bad. That was, there was one bad line reading. The rest of the time, he was perfectly fine. Um, but then Gregory Peck, in some, you know, in some great acting choices you know goldie's gonna tell him like you should call her up you know don't be such a dope or whatever and and then uh and then he just like grabs his shirt <laughs> so gold goldman standing in front of him and he's sitting on the edge of the couch and then he just grabs his shirt and pulls him in and he's like that's exactly what i'm gonna do you know <laughs> like, mm -hmm. okay greg <laughs> maybe chill out yeah that's probably a good idea in general in this uh in this film I mean, who does that? Who's like, I'm going to do something and grabs the person in front of them. <laughs> it's the olden days for you, I tell you. Yeah. Now, so they're all going to go out to, to eat, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and Goldman's going to be sitting there in his uniform, his officer's uniform. And uh, this guy's like, I don't like officers. Weirdest interaction in the movie for me, because... <clears throat> What the fuck? He doesn't like officers? What a random thing. Right, because their their point is, is they're trying to make it out to like him like that he's going to be confronted for being Jewish. The issue is is that unless you're like super Jewish looking, yeah. It's hard to tell, right? Mm -hmm. So you have yes. to figure out a contrived reason for this guy to be upset. And what they came up with is like, you know what? He should wear his uniform and this guy just really doesn't like officers. Why doesn't he like officers, though? I'm so confused. It's it stupid. Work. My point is it's stupid. Oh, okay. So you're not trying to explain it. You're explaining that it is indeed stupid. Got right. It. I'm yeah. explaining it because, like, you didn't need to have this. Yeah, <laughs> really. It's uh, it's like uh, that those guys that come up and confront Luke in, uh, in uh, Most Eisley. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My buddy doesn't like humans either. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah. it's not humans, I, I, don't, I don't like you. Yeah, yeah, just out of nowhere. <laughs> or he doesn't like you. I don't like you either. Okay, yeah. I'll be careful. You better, or you'll be dead. This <laughs> yeah, is pretty much the exact same level of like, what the fuck? Why are you randomly fucking with me, guy? Exactly. Um, so, you know, then, you know, if, I especially don't like them if they're yeds. 
Yeah. When the guy again with the again with the every anti semite on earth being drawn to this. Yeah. This table. Poor Goldman, you know, he's like yeah. probably never had this interaction in his life, and he's like, this, this fucking guy Peck over here, yeah, keeps pectoring people. And <laughs> careful with your careful with your pectoring there, Peck. <laughs> it's interesting that uh, Gregor Peck talks about how solemn he is too, because mm. uh, you know they talk about how he wasn't fun to work with, and I'm like, okay, again, I mean, he said it several times. This is another time that he said it, and it's like, mm. well, okay. I don't know. I guess I'm not really sure why people are like, boy, he wasn't fun to work with. And it's like, well, he was playing a character that's not fun to be around. Yeah. yeah. And actually, this character is, is just very not fun to be around. He's like really a lot. Yeah. That's why I get uh, Kathy's perspective a lot, too, in these arguments. Because it's like, geez, this guy's heavy. You know? Yeah. It's a lot to have to deal with somebody who's being this serious all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, um, good luck with the rest of your life, Kathy. Yeah, exactly. Spoiler alert. Now that they go to, uh, oh, I don't know, they go to, to Connecticut for her sister's party, right? That they're mm -hmm. throwing for their engagement, I guess. Which I didn't know if it was actually going to happen or not because of all the strife that's that's been going on. Seriously. And um, but it does happen. They go there, and now they're going to walk to a dormant cottage. <laughs> yeah, that looks amazing, by the way. And they're just walking around. I'm like, what are we doing? Why are we walking around this house? Are they going to bone? <laughs> like they open a door and it looks like they're gonna they're opening a door to a bedroom like are you ready to do this thing yeah. and it's just just nothing where music starts i know we're we're <sighs> gave me a horn in the beginning and then nothing <laughs> can't leave me hanging like that movie but how rich is she this character kathy here yeah that she just has a house that just like well i liked building a house and i would come to it and think like boy I'd love to live in this house without my husband. <laughs> so, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't we all? Yeah. But then, so now we get a call, right? And um, this is the part where I was like, okay, so we're pretending that Tom doesn't exist for most of this. But now we're going to get a call from Tom, who's yeah. alone with his mother, or with his grandmother, I mean. Yeah. Who's, like, we've already discussed, has is like near death, basically. <laughs> yeah. And he's and and now you're gonna rush home to to be with him because he's scared. When when he first when they first were like Tom is scared, I was like, oh god, what happened to him? He's got beat up because he's a Jew, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. So anyway, the mom's not doing well again. She had like a stroke, I guess. Yeah, just nothing. Oh, no big deal. Just a stroke. I, oh well. <laughs> I know. And then she's like right back up and at him afterwards. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but. Uh, well, I love she how has to be. He won't hire a babysitter. Right, for right. Exactly. And I love how Green is, it, it, Phil here is just so set on fighting everybody. Uh huh. It's like, dude, you don't really know the experience. You can still go back to not fighting it. You yeah. know, like it's. Uh, and at the same time, like if you actually are, if you actually do encounter that all the time in your life, you can't fight every instance of it. Right. It just won't work. But he can because he's only doing it for a month or whatever. All right, it's actually long. Eight weeks. That, yeah. yeah. So he goes to this hotel and he and actually this I think was one of the best scenes in the film when he's like, "Is your hotel restricted?" Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, is that a common term? I'd never heard that before. I'd never heard it either, but I'm going to assume it is because the guy they knew exactly what he meant right away. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this whole conversation, and I think. You know, he was looking for like this moment, right? He was going to get this guy. And nothing happens. He just ends up having to leave. Yeah. And I, I thought it was really perfect for his character to experience that. Mm -hmm. Like, you can go around being angry at everybody all the time for this, but in the end, there's just nothing you can do when it's stacked yeah. against you. Yeah, that's actually true. I, I actually hadn't thought of it that way. Um, I really, I was, I thought this was probably the most important scene in the movie for him. Because you like make, he, you make a good point. I just I think he went around thinking like you just have to fight it. You have to stand up to it, and then it'll end. And then it's like, but you can stand up to it all you want to. If you're powerless, you're still powerless. Mm -hmm. So you're right. He's like he's like aching for somebody to like argue with and fight with at this hotel, and they're just like they're we're not they're not interested. They're like go away. Right. 
Also, the bellboy just knows when the bell rings. He needs yeah. to take the man's luggage away, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. He's a very smart bellboy. He's well trained. And you know, and then he's so now he's he's angry about this, right? And he's gone back to Kathy, and so he's still angry, and she's just like, Well, you know, like talking about Goldman not taking the job. She's like, Well, I probably wouldn't be comfortable there anyway, because mm -hmm. You know they don't like him they don't like his kind so it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense and which i get where he's coming from too it's like how is that a good like how is that good enough for you to accept mm -hmm. you know um and i'm just like well, just leave her dude she's clearly yeah. more accepting of anti-semitism than you are and that's making you upset so just move the fuck on yeah that's the key part it's making you upset just why are you like he's like insisting on fixing this woman yeah and then now tommy's gonna come home and this is where he gets beat up, which you knew was going to happen at some point or other. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess he doesn't get beat up; he just gets picked on, right? Mm -hmm. Called they called him a dirty Jew or something. And then her response to it: "You're no more Jewish than I am. It's just a horrible mistake." <laughs> like that's a weird fucking reaction. Yep. You know, like oh, don't don't worry, they're not right. Right. I just they, was like they would be right, but they're not. I just yeah, exactly, and I just. To me, this whole time, you know, they're trying to say, well, she is anti Semitic. She's nice. She's, an, she's not uh, anti Semitic at all. I just felt like that was, that was stupid. Mm -hmm. I was just bad writing, I think, in, in my opinion. Anyway. And I, I liked what he said to his son about being, about being, um, about it being like good that he didn't admit that he actually wasn't Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. Because, then that's acknowledging that there is something bad about being Jewish and swell about not being Jewish. Yeah. I thought that was actually a good lesson. Yeah. So then she's finally going to be like, you make me feel like I'm a bad person all the time. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, what a surprise that a marriage based on love at first sight <laughs> wouldn't work. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> they didn't ask it. Yeah. So are you anti-Semitic or anything? That's like a good question to find out before you try to, have, try to <laughs> get married just in general. But I thought it was interesting that she was like, you know, fine, I will acknowledge that I'm, you know, that I'm happy that I have these, that I grew up with these, I'm glad I grew up with the advantages. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, so I get where she's coming from. It's like all these people like, it's okay to be white. Like mm -hmm. nobody said it's fucking not okay to be white. As a yeah. matter of fact, everybody's saying it's like, it's pretty awesome being white. Yeah. What they're That's saying is acknowledge it. Yeah. That's exactly it, and uh, it's, I don't know, there were so many parts of this movie where I was like, oh, this is what we're talking about now, too. Like, I know. This is frustrating. It's crazy, right? I mean, we're talking about 76 years ago, mm -hmm. and we've got we've done no better. It, it's just sort of, it makes you kind of depressed. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I did think, though, that I was just like, I, I struggled with her thing here, because I think we were supposed to kind of feel for her. Mm -hmm. And I did in the sense that, like, clearly this isn't the guy for you. But also, like, you're talking about being happy to have the advantages because of people. It's like, yeah, I'm glad that I'm not disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It just felt it felt like it was like she was happy to be advantaged at the detriment to those who are disadvantaged rather than being like. I you wish know, they weren't disadvantaged. I wish they, either. yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank oh, you. I'm glad I'm not one of those people who drowned on the Titanic. <laughs> right. Nice if none of them drowned, but okay. Right. <laughs> it's like you're, you're being rowed away in the lifeboat and you're like, oh, those poor fucks. And I have to say, I really get why Celeste won Best Supporting Actress. I felt like she was a lot of fun in this. Yeah, I liked her too. Then again, I liked everybody more than you did, apparently, so. <laughs> well, she goes in, you know, he's like all depressed because she left and and uh he talks about how I love when men are in pajamas. They look wonderful in pajamas. Yeah. Um <laughs> I don't see why men wear suits or all, at all or clothes at all, really. <laughs> like, okay, lady. <laughs> she was fun. The slipper my phone number, baby. <laughs> and then so now he's gonna get give the big like I'm the same flesh and blood as you and this big speech about like, you know, if you prick me, do I not bleed? You know, exactly. that kind of a speech. 
but he gives it to his Jewish assistant. <laughs> it's like, so, wait a second, you're lecturing me over this? Like, <laughs> no. How, like, is this really the best character to have this moment with? Yeah, evidently. I don't know, though. Um, I was perplexed by it. Imagine doing that like today. <laughs> like, I'm going to pretend to be black. And then you go and like try to tell a black person, you don't understand racism. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, and they're like, you're the one in blackface pretending yeah. to be black. <laughs> I feel like it's you, in fact, who does not understand. So this is there's another good line. Of course, it was from Celeste, mm -hmm. um, who just seemed to know how to deliver her lines better than everybody else in this movie. Um, she was like, you know, it makes sense to me that you were that you're not Jewish, because, like, I don't know how you've lived this long, spending this much juice on it all the time. Mm -hmm. I was like, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I, I really like that, like all these things that you're sort of thinking throughout the movie, they're like, yeah, no, we, we know, yeah. we know that this is happening and we're going to acknowledge it. So I, that really like made me feel a lot better about the film too. I, I would have actually liked if they had gone just a little bit further and like really chastised, like maybe had gold, uh, Goldman or something really chastised Gregory Peck's character. Like, dude, you're not Jewish. Like, yeah, that would have been good, actually. You if, need to calm down. If they if they had that kind of a moment. Mm -hmm. It's something they would do in a, mo a more modern movie. I'm yeah, sure. and, yeah, I'm not I'm not 100% positive it would have worked better, but I would have liked it better. <laughs> well, now he's going to go back and hang out with Anne because she wants to tell him how terrible her life is, mm -hmm. apparently. Uh, Misery Loves Company or something. But then she gives him the smallest cup of coffee ever. I didn't see this. Really? Yeah, I think I, I think it would have offended me, so I wouldn't have. I like blocked it out. It barely fit the sugar cube in it. <laughs> I'm kind of feeling like it can't possibly be that small. Let's. It's let's really small. Alrighty. Oh, that is a small cup. <laughs> I'm not sure it's quite as small as all that, but it's fairly small. And I like that she's yeah. stirring it. So I know so, so daintily. Yeah. I'm kind of feeling like there's nothing in there. Well, she puts a sugar cube in it. Well, it's just one sugar cube that she's moving around. <laughs> right. Well, she says, I know you take it with one sugar. I remember that. You know? mm -hmm. And he's like, okay, creeper. Yeah, exactly. Did I did I tell you that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, well, so now Anne's going to talk about Kathy, and she's got Kathy dead to rights. I mean, mm -hmm. she describes the way Kathy is, oh, like, perfectly. Mm-hmm. And I, I, w I also liked that Kathy wasn't getting some realization at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's so interesting that in 1947, they were showing how, quote, nice white people call their minority friend to tell them that they're not racist or bigoted. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that that still is happening to this day is just crazy to me. But, you know, she, she actually does get a realization eventually. Um, like, it took a while. Like, she really didn't get it. And I was like, I feel like Goldwyn's being pretty obvious in what he's saying mm -hmm. to you, Kathy. Yeah. You seem kind of dumb. <laughs> she might be. But um, so now we're going to, you know, hear his mom reading the, the article, right? And I just found it so interesting that he's invoking the founding fathers, you know, about yeah. like, the idea of America and how, how the founding fathers knew that they would knew that injustice was bad. And I'm just like, like 90% of them were slave owners, if not more. Yeah. Let's just gloss that over. <laughs> There's a meme of, uh, um, uh, it's actually a picture of Ray Charles and it just says, I'm going to pretend I didn't see that. That's what he's doing right there. <laughs> well, now we're going to have in, uh, his mom here. It's going to get another wonderful speech. Which the writing isn't bad, just the delivery is not great. So would, wouldn't it be wonderful if it wound up to be everyone's century? Like, I'm going to live because I want to see the rest of this century. I don't want to just be like, well, you know, didn't happen the way you thought it would. Yeah, it's it's funny looking back this, this far into the future. Not quite yet. Better maybe, but not quite yet. And I also love this idea that she was going to die otherwise. 
Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'll just die. Hold on. Wait a second. Maybe I won't die. Like, no, I want to see anti-Semitism end. Yeah. Which, <laughs> actually, you know, I will say, though, January 1st, 2001, end of the yeah. century, right? December mm -hmm. 31st, whatever you want to say. Yeah. She might have felt pretty good about it. Mm -hmm. Not great, you know, but, like, yeah. it seemed like it was trending in the right direction. Yeah. It, it might be overall going up as well. I don't really know. I have it's hard to say, you know. I feel like I feel like a lot of this is just like the last gasp, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, yeah, that might just be hopefulness, hopeful, I know. Hope, hopefulness, hope is the word I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> it might just be hope to think that way. And on yeah. top of that, it's like I still don't even want to live through it, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Can we get over? Can we not have the last gasp at all? Can the yeah. our previous gasp be the last one? Like, I, why is this? Why is it like such a hard thing? Yeah, I you know. know? Like, poor people are not evil because they're poor. Black people aren't bad because they're black. Mm -hmm. Jewish people aren't bad because they're Jews. Muslims aren't bad because they're Muslims. You know, just fucking move on. Everybody's just a fucking person. Yeah, this isn't complicated. And, like, just really apply it all, all the way down, you know? Yeah. Not, or all the way up. It doesn't matter. All right. Well, I like that this movie is making the point that the people that need to fight like the fight anti-Semitism mm -hmm. the most aren't the minorities that live it. <laughs> yeah. It's the people that don't live it and don't bother speaking up about it. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that need to fight. And that's what a lot of, I mean, that's what it's been going on, on, on a lot lately too. Like, well, why should I have to speak up every time? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. why can't you speak up? You know, and, and it's not, and it's not about being like, a savior either it's not like mm -hmm. i'm gonna step up for this person and i'll be their savior it's more just like just when we're not around mm -hmm. and somebody says something don't let them get away with it mm -hmm. and you know i'll be honest i it makes me feel bad because i'm sure that there have been times in my life where i let people do it and i don't say anything mm -hmm. you know and i generally think of myself as a pretty outspoken person mm -hmm. but I don't know that I that I always live up to those kind of ideals. Yeah, I uh, I'm sure. You know, it's funny because there's probably even times that you didn't even think of it. Not you. I mean, yeah, we didn't even think of it because, like, you know, it's not something we face, so it's just not. You know, it's just but we, we might not even have noticed all sorts of casual racism and anti-Semitism and everything else. Well, you know, I've committed microaggressions without you know, like I don't realize it or anything, and I feel guilty that I have. Mm -hmm. but like part of the point of this is like to acknowledge that you have like nobody's perfect you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's the thing people when you like try to tell people things like that like oh you know well you know you might have offended somebody or committed this or that or the other thing and they'll take it as like an attack on them personally right instead of, instead of going oh shit sorry right realize it's such a weird reaction right mm -hmm. just like it's not it's not about you yeah. just be like oh well then i guess that's something i'll yeah. Try to refrain from doing in the future. Yeah, not everything requires you defending yourself quite yeah. so vociferously. It's 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 a bit much. It it's is. more than a bit much. That's like the understatement of the century. In, fa <laughs> in fact, that was a bit of an understatement. <laughs> well, that's it for the movie. Let's move that's... on to the rank. <laughs> oh, by the way, we did mention that at the very end, he uh, decides to go up to Kathy's. Oh, right, he goes which, back so, to Kathy. Which is a double, in my opinion, but they needed to end on something. I thought ending on Anne's speech would have been fine. I think it would have been too. In fact, it felt just a little tacked on. Like, eh, well, we have to have some kind of happy ending instead of just, man, I do something right? <laughs> well, let's move on to the rank. Yep. Oh, rank. All right, the rank is where we rank the movie based on 10 categories. Story, acting, originality, film coherence, cinematography, score slash soundtrack, script structure and dialogue, character relatability, production value, and timelessness. We rank it on a scale of one to a zillion. Actually, 10. Uh, one being the worst. And I like how you brought that back. I forgot and I said it. <laughs> 10 being the best. Uh, we start with story, and I'm going first. So I gave story a 9.25. Uh, I think the story is really is is a really good one. You know, uh -huh. you know I'm a sucker for a good journalism movie, and here was mm -hmm. another one that worked for me. So, um, the undercover journalist always a fun story. It's an interesting look at anti-Semitism. I know that we have a tendency to show things this way, you know, in the like 
let's make it relatable to the to the white Christian way. Um, mm-hmm. But it is fascinating to have someone condense all the hate to eight weeks. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like a, 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 a Judaism speed run, right? <laughs> so, uh, what about you? What do you have for story? Well, I gave story a six million seven hundred fifty-seven thousand eight hundred and sixty-two, which, which on a scale of really one low is I'm really scared. low. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you knew that because I was just going to make a point that that's a large <laughs> number, but you know, it's a scale of a zillion. It's basically zero. But uh, no, I uh, what is a scale one? I, uh, story I gave a nine. I think is what I said. Don't have my thing. You're not now sure. It's, <laughs> now it's uh, let me open it. There it's it's open. Yeah, I gave actually I gave it a nine point two five. Um, oh, same as me. Yeah, um, yeah. I, actually, everything you said—it was a good story, and uh, it's a fun idea. I kind of, kind of surprised they haven't remade it. You know what I mean? Like, it does seem like it would be a good one to remake. Yeah, because this is always like an issue that Hollywood, I'm sure, is interested in. And I'm not making aspersions toward Hollywood being one religion or another, um, like many people do. But they love these kind of movies, anti-racism movies. You know. Um, and it could work. It could work even in different situations. Like, for instance, you could make a movie where someone is biracial and could pass as one thing or another. And you right. could examine it, like, from their perspective, even, of someone who is or isn't something. Or you get people who are, like, have... You get people. I say, you get people. No. Um, some people, it's like nobody can tell what race they are. And, like, they get awkward questions about, well, what are you? Stuff like that. Yeah. So I mean, you could do all sorts of things with it, but uh, I don't know. I feel like I feel like you don't hear about this movie much or the story much, given that it won Best Picture. But otherwise, it's good. You know, it's funny that you bring that up. <clears throat> I remember a conversation when I was in the military. This person, you know, when you're a teenager, you're more geared up to fight, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, unless you're Gregory Peck, in which case, <laughs> right? Like that just lasts forever, apparently. Yeah. Um, Bill Green, sorry. But. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I remember I, I asked this guy who was, you know, light skinned probably. Mm-hmm. Um, he was ambiguous either way, right? And I was just like, Where are you from? And he was like, I'm from America. And I'm like, uh-huh. I, I know, we're in the Air Force. <laughs> like, I was curious where in America you were from. Like, it, it didn't even occur to me that I was, I wasn't yeah. asking, like, what nationality are you? I was just mm-hmm. like, You know, I'm from New York. Where are you mm-hmm. from? You know? Mm-hmm. And he was like, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, man. I, I could just imagine getting all sorts of shitty racism, though, and then you're on edge, and then you do right. something like that, and it's like, oh, well, now I feel stupid, but also I'm on edge all the time. Which is why it didn't make sense for Phil here to be constantly yeah. like going after everybody. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so the next category is acting. What do you have for that? You're going to laugh. I gave, I gave acting eight and a half. I thought it was pretty okay. Mm. Um, so that, that that noise I feel like I know what it means but uh, yeah I thought it wasn't necessarily great I'm a little surprised I got a, I nominated for quite so many acting categories right? I, I get like a couple of them and the, the lady who won who's now I can't remember now Celeste she, Holm yeah. yeah she was in fact good um, it was like very mannered and very um, like message movie acting mm-hmm you know what I've learned from all of this? Anti-Semitism is bad. That's like, that's okay. <laughs> I think we knew that. But um, you sometimes you have to, I guess, flat out say it that way. But uh, yeah, I thought it was okay. Everybody was fine. And uh, so what about you? What do you think? I gave it a 5.75. Oh, well, that's not an 8.75. Or did I give it 8.5? I can't remember. You get an 8.5. Yeah, yeah, so the acting was not good, especially in the first half of this movie. Mm-hmm. Mr. Green's mom was awful throughout. <laughs> just terrible. Gregory Peck and Dorothy McGuire were okay. Um, mm-hmm. I think Dorothy McGuire was better than Gregory Peck. But Gregory Peck, I think for him, it was just that he was very uneven. There mm-hmm. were times when he was good, and there were times when he was very much not. Um, the guy who played Goldman and Celeste Holm, I think, were the standouts. Probably right. Um, everyone else was a hammy mess. So. <laughs> Actually, the little boy was better than the majority of the adult cast. So. I, don't, I don't know that I would say that quite quite to that point. I thought the little boy was good too, though, or fine for you know an actor. But uh, yeah. I thought it was the poorest acting of the movies we ranked so far this year. So, well, the uh, second you know what? the second I, half of the movie though saved this from being below a five. 
I would actually agree with that. Possibly with the... Um, I would agree with that with the exception of Miracle on 34th Street, but I think the acting in Miracle on 34th Street was supposed to be very broad. Yeah. Because it's it's like a Christmas thing, so you can't have... You're not supposed to have like this deep, complex character shit, which I think we mentioned. Um, this, you probably should have a bit more internal like conflict conflict between in your characters that is not always presented that way. Um, but actually, the other two movies had really solid acting in my opinion and in crossfire's case really really good acting so i thought crossfire be... was definitely the best acting of all of the ones we've watched mm -hmm. this year i i want to ask you at the end if you think which movie you think did a better job of looking at anti-semitism and everything oh yeah i definitely want to have that conversation too well it's here let's go on to go on finish this up because i I, I'm interested in that conversation. So, um, all right. The next category is originality, and uh, I gave that a nine. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because I gave Crossfire a good originality score in tackling this kind of a topic, mm -hmm. you know? And I was really surprised with that one to see a movie going after anti-Semitism in the 40s. But mm -hmm. here we are, a second one in the same year. Mm -hmm. um, although it goes about it in a less subtle way. I think, feel like Crossfire was a little bit more subtle. Yeah. Like they weren't like, well, this is about anti Semitism. Like this movie was just like, we're going to talk about anti Semitism. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, the speeches were probably more, less subtle in this movie than they were mm -hmm. in the other one, ironically. Yeah. But um, so I don't know. Although it goes, I feel like this is, this is a hard category now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I, I decided I didn't think it was as original as Crossfire. Mm hmm. But I like that it was tackling an important subject, which I don't think movies were doing that often at this point. Mm -hmm. So I gave it a nine. That's where I'm coming from. What, what about you? Well, I gave it a nine as well. I would like to go back, though. I've been thinking since you talked about acting. I'm going to put acting down to, to an eight. Um, still, I thought it was fine. Uh, and I don't know. Maybe I should put it down even farther because fine is not eight. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'll put it down a whole point and give it seven and a half. A little bit of you know uh, you know good in some ways but generally fine yeah i mean you clearly didn't it didn't get to you no, as much as it did me but yeah. uh it yeah. took me out a lot I, I was like constantly like what the fuck is happening <laughs> um so anyway so originality i also gave a nine and you kind of nailed every point um it's i i kind of love that they made this movie like i think it was a little clumsy in some ways and a little over obvious and a little preachy even yeah yeah I agree. Like a very, a very Hollywood patting itself on the back kind of thing, but still, it's 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 great that it exists and that they were able to do it. And um, I kind of like the idea of him like trying to pass as Jewish. I, I, it's it's kind of a fun idea. So, I think if he had just put on a nose pros prosthetic, yeah, Jesus you know? Christ! <laughs> well, we're, we're we're having that right now. I don't know if you've seen Bradley Cooper in um, Maestro. No, I, I haven't he's seen playing Leonard. Ads. Yeah, he's playing uh, Leonard Bernstein, and he wore, wore a nose prosthetic in it, and it's and it's quite the nose prosthetic. And some people are like, "So he's playing a Jewish guy, so he wore a nose prosthetic. This is this is great." But uh, <laughs> but actually, Leonard Bernstein's family came out in support of it and said that you know whatever, so, whatever. I, maybe you should just put Steve Carell in that role. <laughs> yeah, why not? I feel like um, you didn't need Bradley Cooper, did you? You could have gone somebody else. <laughs> He only wrote it and directed it. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> and I'll star. Like, <laughs> well, um, let's move on to the next category, which is film coherence. So, what do you have for that? Uh, film coherence. I gave an eight. I, I thought it was pretty coherent. I uh, didn't understand, or I didn't like um, a lot of Phil's motives. I, I just kept wanting to say to him, "Stop!" Like you're. This, you're doing too much. This is you. You can't just get up and fight every single person. Or like right. he even goads people. Like yeah. Instead of saying, "What were you gonna say?" Huh? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, but they didn't say it. So relax a little bit. And like he'll be like, "What did you mean by that? Huh? Did you mean because I'm Jewish?" And like they, I asked if you wanted coffee. You know, like yeah. And it just felt like too much. But that I think, I'm not sure if that is just his character. That he's taking it too seriously and maybe even the movie knows that i don't feel like it does though i feel like it understands where he's coming from and thinks he's doing a, a good thing um so i didn't love that but other than that you know everybody was it was all it was all fine 
Yeah, I felt like the movie did a good job of being sort of self-aware, you know, mm -hmm. for the most part. I do think that that was a little bit over the top. I think they tried to address it, but they never really did it adequately, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I gave it a nine and a half, and I'm, yep. I'm wondering if it's too high. So I thought it was I, – I, basically, I was – I'm thinking. I was thinking about the flow of the movie, you mm -hmm. know, like beginning to end. Did anything not fit the story? That kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. I was thinking it co probably could have been a little shorter. Yeah, definitely. Um, maybe spend a little less time in the romance between Green and Kathy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that was a good relationship to show. Mm -hmm. I don't think the end was very good. Him going no, back to her, I, like I, I didn't hate it or it was just like I was yeah, ambivalent, was, you know. Yeah. It was okay. This this is happening now, but um, um, yeah, you actually make a great point about the this movie drags at several points. Yeah, and it, it shouldn't. It should definitely use its time more wisely. I think I'm gonna drop it to an eight and a half. You do you. Well, I was like try. I, there was something about it that I just was like, it doesn't feel right. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. So I think you elucidated that a little bit for me. And all in all, I, th I thought it was really good. I just, maybe it, it could have been, I think it just needed to be trimmed. A yeah, bit. I think so too. So let's go to the next category, which is cinematography. So I gave cinematography a six and a half. Okay. It was okay. You know, nothing crazy here. Uh, they didn't push any boundaries, but they didn't obscure the story with it either. Um, mm -hmm. So there was only one moment that stood out to me in any direction. And that's when he, when, when he first walks into the magazine offices and after he leaves the receptionist, this other guy walks in and just yeah, starts weird. stands right in front of the camera. It's very weird. But um, so yeah, not the best thing, but to, to stand out, I guess, when you're doing a <laughs> ranking, but, uh, you know, whatever. What I do especially you noticed that weird shot of the guy standing there. Well, it's, it was weird, but 6.75, same. It was fine. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, it was serviceable. I don't know that they needed to do anything crazy. So it worked fine. Yeah. Well, let's go to the next category, which is score slash soundtrack. What do you have for that? I, I gave that a four. Mm. I mean, I don't, was it even like, you know, was there anything? And I don't think, unlike Crossfire, they didn't use like poignant silences to great effect. So right. it just seemed like it was, it was almost like they, for, they, oh God, we need a score for this movie. You know, like, like it was due the next day or something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's ridiculous though. I don't know. I mean... Right. I, I felt the same way. I gave it a five. I didn't okay. really know what to do for it. Um, same. It, was, it was very, eh, you know, mm -hmm. um, there were only a few times that I could remember hearing the music. And most of the time it felt like it didn't fit the movie. Um, yeah, exactly. the music, but the only thing that saved, like, cause I wanted to give it lower than a five actually, but there were music, there were music playing during the scenes between Kathy and Phil that mm -hmm. I thought were decent, you know? Mm -hmm. Where it like helped you build, like it helped you see that they were feeling, having feelings for each other. So I was like, all right, I won't go below a five. So that's where I was. Okay. Anyway, the next category is script structure and dialogue. And I give that a 4.25. Okay. <laughs> the dialogue in this is terrible. It's just terrible. <laughs> um, which certainly didn't help the acting. And this was all too high-handed and heavy-handed uh -huh. with speeches that people wouldn't say. <laughs> and the structure was actually pretty good, but the dialogue was just eye-rolling at best. Mm -hmm. So that's it. What do you got for strips at this one? <laughs> <laughs> um, I gave it a 6.75. I thought a lot of it was was okay. Um, I kind of liked the sev several of the speeches toward the end, like Goldman's speech. For, well, speech. You know, he's, he's talking to Kathy. But I thought that was good. And... Um, some of their arguments worked okay for me, but like you said, it was just so grandiose, some of it. Like, I liked the sentiment behind, like, the mom's final speech, but, like, really? Like, you know what I mean? Well, the mom's final speech, okay, the sentiment, you're right. I, I liked that part of it, but I was just like, how ha how pleased is Moss Hart with this yeah. fucking speech? You know? Exactly. He's so pleased with himself for this, and it's not that fucking good, dude. Yeah, it's not. That's a hundred percent. Just imagine him smiling at his typewriter, like, "Oh, I'm so good." But yeah, you know, whatever. exactly. But whatever. But I mean, some of it did work for me, and uh, I kind of do wonder about, you know, if maybe the acting had been better, if the, if the dialogue might have worked better for you. Maybe you know, and that could be the you know that that tends to happen, right? Mm -hmm. 
bad acting can drag down good dialogue and bad dialogue drags down good acting. So, mm -hmm. well, the next category is character relatability. What do you have for that? I give that an eight and a half. Um, I thought it was pretty good in that way. Um, I kind of got a lot of uh, Green's frustration, especially like when he's like, well, I'm trying to be Jewish. And then he like notices, wow, life kind of fucking sucks when you're Jewish <laughs> in a lot of ways. Like I got, like I understood that anger that he was like, wow, this is all suddenly awful and I'm angry about this. Um, but I also got like a lot of the contradiction between that fact and the fact that like, I guess he didn't care much before that. So he's just like coming to learn about it, you know, the realities of anti-Semitism. But then also I very much empathized with the, uh, with Kathy because I thought that he was being kind of unfair to her, but also she's trying to recognize. Yeah, right. I, I, I know. I like, I'm trying, she's trying and I get that. Like sometimes you don't know what to do. Should I speak out or would that be even worse? It's tough. And everybody else was pretty much the same. Well, especially as a female, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're in a, yeah, well, she, she's going to scream at this guy at the party, you know? Right. You're in a, you're in, not in a position of power typically. Mm-hmm. I, I felt the same way as you did. I actually gave it a 9.75. Mm, even better. I found myself relating to the characters really strongly, mm -hmm. which is kind of incredible. I think yeah. that speaks a lot to the story, actually, because I thought the dialogue and acting were not very good. <laughs> so for me to empathize with the characters this much goes to show how um, much I was brought in by the story, right? It was actually the other part that made me feel like this was good was that it made me feel introspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. Um, I, you know, I, you know, and I said before, I consider myself an outspoken person, but I do think I shy away from it now. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm more, I shy away from confrontation more than I ever used to. And I'm sure it's an aspect of having kids and, you know, like you don't necessarily need to fight every battle and you want to be around for your kids. Right. So, yeah. um, <laughs> but I, it freaked me out a little bit. Cause I was like, maybe I'm more like Kathy than yeah. I'd like to be, you know? I don't know. Anyway, so there you go. So the next category is production value, and uh, I give that a nine. Okay. I thought the production value was really good in this. I never felt like I was on a set. They did a great job of adorning the offices without too much glamour, but adorning the rich people's with it, um, mm -hmm. which people's homes with it. And I also felt like Green's apartment fit his circumstances. You know, it was, mm -hmm. um, but it, I don't know. I, I thought it was good. I don't know. I think with the poor acting and dialogue, it was really important to have this aspect to be high or else the story wouldn't have been saved, in my opinion. Yeah, it might have seemed just such a shoddy production. Right. Like am amateurish. Exactly. And so this, I think, really helps the movie. So what what about you? What do you have for it? Uh, seven and a half, which now I'm kind of wondering is too low because I just put it on. I wanted good, not necessarily like incredible, but then again, what, what, what was required that they didn't do well? You know? Right. Exactly. So I feel like maybe I should put it higher. I'll just leave it for right now. Well, the last category, the hardest category, is next, and that's timelessness. And what do you have for that? I I, I gave it a five. Um, I uh, feel like it's a good movie to like achieve a somewhat timeless status because I would like people to see it and think about it and talk about it. But I don't feel like it has, and it's also not so memorable. It doesn't have like. It's it, it thinks it has these speeches at the end that people are going to remember, and it's like a powerful moment in cinema, but it doesn't play out that way. It's not like, what's this, uh, Henry Fonda's speech in Grapes of Wrath or anything, you know what I mean? It's not right. It's not something that people really remember, and they don't, clearly, since this is not that well-known a movie, despite the fact that it was one best picture. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I, actually, I gave it a six. Mm -hmm. And the reason I gave it a six is because I gave Crossfire a six. Okay. So it was sort of the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I think this should have been lower than Crossfire. Mm -hmm. But in reality, Crossfire is probably lower on timelessness than this one is. Um, strictly because this one best picture. So I evened it out. Gave mm -hmm. it both the six. Huh, works for me. Um, so reality and, and opinion converge. <laughs> is, mm -hmm. is what happens. Well, that's it. That's the whole movie. That's the rank. Um, so I, I don't think it's best picture for this year. <laughs> it is definitely not. <laughs> okay. Is it, is it in last place? It It is in last place for this that year. That is not surprising. And, and by the I, way. And by more than I would think, too. By 12 
0.25 points or yeah they were actually 11.75 there were a couple of categories that we were not enthralled with with i think year. it was very uneven i think there were yeah. categories that we thought you know was were really good but then there were mm -hmm. categories that were just basically like kind of very eh. it's absolutely the case um which is to, not to say that it's like some bad movie it's fine no it's um, a good movie i i to, to bring it to what you what we mentioned before uh i i think crossfire was a lot more subtle and yes it's a depiction of these things and a lot more I don't know, not exciting. A lot more um, thought provoke, like thought provoking, in like an engaging way. Yeah, like, like I was interested in what was happening, and because well, there was suspense and, with, yeah, them, you know? yeah, exactly. And it was like depicting anti-Semitism as it occurs in real life naturally, right? As Rather than goading people into it, yeah, exactly. So, um, I like but it's also good to of. show microaggression type of remarks too, just to For show sure. like these are the things that you may not recognize that you're saying and doing that do have an effect on people mm -hmm. but yeah I, I i mean i like crossfire more yeah i actually too. am sort of surprised that crossfire isn't the uh the best one the best yeah. bishop's wife i mean i i don't know bishop's wife was really good i just yeah i can't i don't know how i feel about that but gentleman's agreement ended up being the uh being under Miracle on 34th Street, but above Million Dollar Baby and The Aviator. Huh. I'm not bad. Which so I'm actually okay with. I, I think it was a better movie than both of those. I think so, too. It's so interesting, these movies across eras, you know, because I wouldn't normally think of them together. But it is interesting <laughs> to think, which was this better than Million Dollar Baby? I think so. I think it was. I'm having a lot of fun with this. <laughs> it's, it's just that the, the time is just so interesting. Like, yeah the gap all right so that's the whole episode thanks everybody for listening if you'd like to see an updated list of our rankings you can see that on our website at the rank with john and zach.com check us out next week when we're ranking the 2012 movie the expendables 2 starring sylvester stallone jason statham liam hemsworth jet lee dolph lundgren terry cruz randy couture chuck norris jean claude van damme bruce willis and arnold schwarzenegger and directed by simon west <laughs> mm. So if the action movie series isn't your thing, uh, then join us in two weeks for the next movie in our Best Picture series, which is going to be the last for 1947. Um, Great Expectations, the 1947 Best Picture nominee starring John Mills and Valerie Dobson and directed by David Lean. Well, goodbye. And let's make a gentleman's agreement to see you next week. I gotta tell you, knowing a tiny bit about computers, but not much, is like awful. Cause like <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Like I wish I knew more, but I don't. So I can't do so much shit. <laughs> and I'll just like I'll like know some stuff and be like, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing. And then I'm like, what the fuck is this?